गुड मॉर्निंग फ्रेंड्स and today also with us the uh, today's resource person dhananjay gokhale garu from bombay he traveled a uh, long way from uh, to here actually uh, we are blessed today who are uh, members uh, coming to the this session we are blessed because today's speaker is not a uh, uh, he is member of our fraternity but uh, he is not an ordinary speaker he is the speaker for the total all over india central statutory auditors speaker okay he knows whatever the uh, march 6th uh, notification and all whatever the thing in and out he knows only because we are blessed here uh, all we are sitting here and another thing is also in future we are planning to uh, we want to start the seminar and schedule time okay please cooperate i am requesting you all and uh, sir i would like to extend my warm welcome to the vijayawada branch sir we are uh, happy to be here in part of our today's sessions and uh, have graciously accepted our invitation to share uh, your knowledge to our members and enriching of our no uh, members knowledge his presence is today a testament to the significance of this uh, seminar and the commitment of our industry leaders to support the growth and development of the profession definitely it will be fruitful to us uh, each and every one definitely it will be added advantage to do the bank audit in the professional manner uh, after the end of today's sessions uh, uh, afternoon also we are having the speaker of ravindra sir he is from the salem he is also well known in your every every week we are getting the youtube video he is the expert in the npa all the things so where is the how to find the things in the npa how to drop the moc also okay today definitely end of the day will enrich our knowledge definitely we are uh, fit for that to do bank audit in effective manner comparing to the previous uh, we are already experienced so on the people past members past uh, chairmen of the branch also here in addition to that we definitely we are going to the enriching our knowledge every day and today end uh, definitely i am giving the promise to you end of the day definitely we will more fit for to do the, to do the bank audit thank you for giving the opportunity thank you nan babaru i request vice chairman of the branch nitar kishor sir to introduce today's speaker good morning all of you friends uh, before formally saying a few words sir uh, about uh, today's uh, speaker uh, let me tell you that uh, he is the most uh, sought after speaker in the entire country entire march i don't think uh, he will be at home for even a single day friends uh, i wonder sometimes how the uh, chartered accountants like uh, dhananjay sir could uh, spent uh, such amounts of uh, time without expecting any monetary benefit whatsoever be and uh, they are always are uh, striving to the improvement of uh, the fraternity as well as uh, the knowledge that is being shared by these kind of speakers is very immense friends uh, i humbly think that uh, or opine that uh, it is uh, our responsibility uh, to get enriched from these uh, kind of uh, speakers so actually this uh, program if you if you remember we we have changed the flyer at first uh, our flyer was uh, on uh, the 14th and the 15th of uh, march our program was but actually it is uh, thereafter changed to 15 and 16 the reason being that uh we requested sir to be here on a 15th right so the tickets were also booked sir has gave his acceptance readily but uh, uh you should believe that uh, the regions and branches of head office called our branch and uh, specifically requested us that dhananjay sir should be a speaker at the central statutory auditors meet organized by the head office of uh, our institute they they have requested us and you know one thing what condition we have laid down to them whatever 
expenses we incur because of change in the schedule, it should be borne by head office. That was the condition our branch has laid down to the head office and they have readily accepted for that also. So this year, we should understand that uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 how, how Dhananjay sir uh, is uh, required by all the people across the country. We are so fortunate uh, that we have him amongst us here today. So friends, uh, see uh, Dhananjay Gokhale is a Bachelor of Commerce from the University of Mumbai and a fellow member of ICA and is all into practice since 25 years. He is a founding partner of the firm, Mrs. Dhananjay J. Gokhale & Co. Chartered Accountants, specialized in providing management consultancy, auditing and assurance service in corporate and banking sector. He is co opted member of AASB for 1819, co opted as special invitee at AASB for 21-22, 22-23, 23-24, Nominated as a subgroup member of Banking and Insurance Pension Committee of WIRC of ICAI, and also convener of study group formed for ICAI guidance note on audit of banks 2019 edition, deputy convener of the study group formed by ICAI for guidance note on audit of banks 2022 edition, Member of expert panel constituted by Auditing and Assurance Standard Board of ICA for addressing bank queries of the members since 11 12. So still he is on that panel. Whenever we ask a or pose a query to the head office uh, with respect to any of the bank audit issues, sir will be on that panel who will be answering the members. Authorized article in background material for executive master's program for new age auditors by center of audit quality of ICI. ICI guidance note on audit of banks right from 2016 edition to 2022 edition. ICI manual on concurrent audit of banks, ICI magazine, reference material published by WARC on a statutory bank audit. He has handled various assignments relating to the arena of bank audits, including statutory central audit of PSB and merger and acquisition of Urban Cooperative Bank and consultant to CEO or Board of Banks. He is a regular speaker at various seminars on standards on auditing and bank audit across all regions and various branches of ICI. He has been a speaker at staff training seminars organized by public sector private sector and urban cooperative banks and uh, association of banks. Friends, we present before you an expert in bank audit and banking transactions. Sir, it's all yours. Yeah, I want to add one point about the challenges that actually uh, out of total, uh, we taking the six to seven sessions. Branches only two to three branches here accepted. Out of 167 branches all over the India, only two to three branches are ex accepted. Out of uh, three branches, we are the one branch. Oh. And uh, in addition to that, sir, uh, I request on behalf of the young members are also sitting here now. Last, uh, I request you, sir, whatever the future provision also, in, in addition to the bank audit, uh, please throw a light on that also. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Sir, and Vice Chairman Sir, and all the committee members. Uh, somehow, I was missing to come to this branch for last, I think, three to four years, and uh, uh, it's my you know pleasure to be here uh, because for last three four years, some of the dates were not matching. To be very frank with you, and uh, with speaker, actually, what really happens is once you commit to a particular branch, it's not good to change it. Unfortunately, that happened with your branch, where I had to change that program, but. Uh, Typically, what happens is the central committees of institute, which are there like PDC or double uh, those are required to be given a little bit of preference because uh, 
many times there are certain criticalities are there uh, in front of uh, regulators like uh, earlier i was supposed to come here on 14th but there was a seminar which was organized by pdc at uh, mumbai along with rbi officials for central auditors so uh, sometimes technical issues uh, you know might crop up so uh, that's the reality so there was no other intention than uh, you know to postpone your program so my apologies for that because i can understand that you know the entire uh, uh you know the uh, uh, task of uh, management committee becomes a kind of a challenging thing when it, whenever any date has to be changed so uh, 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 really sorry for that uh, as far as today's topic is concerned uh, you know it's good that you know i don't have any specific topic in the sense uh, otherwise usually i have to confine myself to uh, ppt and go along with the topic uh but i will not confine to any particular topic what i will try to do is that i will just uh, take you through the mind coding process in entirety right from the beginning till the uh, end i will try to add certain uh, issues which i experienced at the time of uh, conducting mind coding or certain queries which typically are uh, you know raised at the time of doing mind branch audit uh we will try to discuss as much as possible to the extent that uh, uh, unless there is a controversial point i will just avoid that but otherwise i will not uh, hesitate from speaking upon that so just to begin with actually let me just touch upon that 6 march uh, letter which i'm sure that uh, it was circulated widely on uh, whatsapp and other things because nowadays uh, what really happens is the moment any circular comes up in fact it is not even a circular it's a letter actually which is written by rbi to the bank and frankly speaking no one is privy to that letter unless and until such circulation happens now that circular talks about uh, number of branches or other percentage of coverage of advances from earlier 80% to 70% norm and there are a couple of changes which have occurred uh, let me first just highlight you about which are the changes which have occurred uh, it's up to you to decide whether they are good or bad because everyone's perception might be different one change which has occurred is number of branches per firm have been reduced from 3 to 3 uh, to 2 so 2 uh, will be the upper cap uh, according to me it's a welcome sign because the reason is that uh, unfortunately we are not having that uh, capacity of manpower to handle three branches at a time and deliver the report by say 7th or 8th because there is a manpower constraint which all of us has tried to it's not that we are not able to do a particular audit but it's more about uh, having manpower available in that particular period Uh, if it is if sufficient time is there, uh, then that's not an issue. Like just to give an example, central auditors are uh, having twenty top twenty branches which are undertaken, but throughout the year that uh, uh, those branches can be audited. That doesn't happen in case of uh, statutory branch auditors. So we have limited time and we need to execute that work. So this is one change which has occurred. Second change which has occurred is about uh, the criteria. If you look at the tabular chart which is given, there is a slight change which has occurred. Earlier, the experience was counted in terms of number of years which the firm has conducted the bank audit. So now uh, there is a sufficient weightage which is given to the partner who has conducted the audit. So if there is a merger, demerger, or any dissolution, retirement, new formation of an entity happens, the experience goes along with the person who has signed the balance sheet. Uh, in a way it's a good thing because now it's in sync with what we do for mea for any other environment because if you recall there we have number of years of experience of the partner which is specified because typically for any professional uh, you know firm whether it is doctor ca lawyer or anyone what counts is the experience of the person who is doing that work so that is one change which has occurred which was not there earlier again as i said whether it is good or bad it's individual perception but what i felt was that it is fairly fine to uh, fine tune that now it is in sync with what institute was following as far as all other implements were concerned so it will fall in line coming to the ticklish point about 70% coverage uh, for current financial year that is 22 to 23 and subsequently they have given the discretion to the audit committee of that bank to decide about the coverage now at the same time they have retained a particular para which talks about covering cross sections across the various types of branches in terms of geographical area in terms of type of advances also so that still remains but one major change which has occurred is earlier that coverage was supposed to be in consultation with the central auditor so that point is missed out now so uh, theoretically if you ask me theoretically it means that uh, audit committee can take decision without consulting the statutory auditor that is the central auditor practically i don't think that that will really happen because ultimately the person who is signing that balance sheet he needs to have uh, kind of satisfaction about the coverage of audit and if there is something which is uh, in a way of uh, say kind of scope limitation uh, central auditor has every power to say that vocally either in audit committee uh, or acb meeting 
or it through his report so <laughs> it will never hamper the work of uh, you know audit in a greater way uh, there were n number of rumors comments which are coming in social media that audits will go branch audit won't be there practically it is very difficult to uh, really get into that mode because even if everything is centralized there are certain things which are required to be seen always at the branch level there are certain government schemes which are there which are always at the branch level they are not at the centralized level but hypothetically let's presume that after 10 years down the line that really happens that everything is centralized and everything is digitized which gradually is happening in each and every area just to give an example if you compare that with say gst returns right now we are doing work of gst return but imagine a scenario where invoicing is made mandatory to follow up so practically there is no return which is required to be compiled in the sense the data is only collated and Uh, you know that particular GST register vendor will come to know what is his liability. He has to simply pay the liability because it will. There is no matching as such which is required. It's only question of whether that particular purchase is eligible for that set of or not. So, suppose by mistake, as a firm, suppose I purchase something for my personal use, but my GST number is appearing. I need to only remove that. Nothing beyond that. So the work which we are doing right now will, in days to come, might drastically reduce. But at the same time. There is sufficient opportunity which will be always available in various other forms. Just to give an example, if you talk about the banking area, even if we are talking only about statutory audit per se, and we always feel that it's cost benefit, uh, you know, wise it is the best thing to happen because in ten days we might be getting a fee to the range of say three lakhs to maybe say six lakhs, seven lakhs. For a bigger firm, it might be ten lakh plus also. But at the same time, we need to. Uh, introspect ourselves as to whether we can have this monopoly lasting uh, you know as a forever thing in today's world no monopoly can really exist we need to create our monopoly in the areas of specialization so it's not a question of retaining that monopoly it's only question of changing the form of our practice there are n number of things wherein banks are lagging behind i will just uh, you know name couple of them like for example risk based internal audit has been already introduced in public sector bank or oh, sorry commercial banks since 2002 but till today they are yet to stabilize that system if you ask ourselves whether we are equipped with knowledge about risk based internal audit the answer is big no we are not even aware about what is risk based internal audit per se and if you want to test ourselves just imagine a scenario that suppose a bank approaches you to devise a risk based internal audit system for themselves can we really do that on one hand we are saying that we are expert in bank audit on other hand we are lagging behind in the basics of that that risk based internal audit what it really means is you need to do a kind of a process audit identify the risk so you need to be aware about the entire banking garment then only you can give this kind of a consultancy service so it's better that we start equipping ourselves in those areas so in days to come maybe concurrent audit might be replaced by risk based internal audit now just to give a kind of a comparative analysis uh, in company audits we are doing ifc or internal financial controls over reporting now ifc or has been already implemented in banking system how many of us really test those systems when you are doing bank branch audit or maybe a concurrent audit we hardly do that because our entire focus is only on bank balance sheet then the next one is focus is on the figure of advances to calculate that what will be our fees that is something you know which we need to do away with we need to develop our consultancy service and the attestation function we don't know whether it will stay on a long term basis or not it might get reduced to certain extent but consultancy and all these services will always remain so even if you are feeling that after 70% uh, there is no future for ca and all this that is not the reality we have a number of things which are already around us let me give another example of that if i ask any one of you that who is having you know no work at office you know like there is no pendency of work no one can raise their hand i'm sure about that and we are ample kind of work. in fact to be very uh, frank with you when the pandemic started off and uh, when the lockdown was there even in spite of having that period available in our hand we were not able to complete the earlier pendency of work that is the hard reality forget about our uh, you know staff and other things just ask ourselves that whether we will already through with all the pending, pending work or not and the answer is very difficult to give in an informative tone so we are ample or sufficient work only thing is that we need to change the tone of our work we need to just see the developments which are happening take it as it is going and see the second vital point is that why that percentage and other things are reducing there are two uh, you know angles to that one is that with automation there are certain things which can be centrally done there are certain things which are still decentralized so concurrent audit internal audit revenue audit credit audit stock audits these are going to stay because 
there is a kind of monitoring system which is required. So form of our audit might undergo change. But at the same time, we need to ask ourselves that suppose we are doing audit for say last 10 years or 20 years. If you ask ourselves and if you want to answer in, uh, uh, you know, in the reality, what was the value addition which we did for that particular branch in terms of improvisation of their services or in terms of finding lacunas in their system? Or whether we have spent just seven days or ten days, uh, you know, going at some outstation place or not. I am not making a generic statement, but that is the introspection which we need to make if we want to really progress further and if we really want to, uh, you know, get along with the changes which are occurring around us. Another important thing is that as far as artificial intelligence is concerned, it's not going to replace any human being. I will just give a comparable example. See, if you recall, maybe almost fifteen or twenty years back. There was a computerization which started up in banking sector, and there was a UN cry about that. You know that the job of bankers will go. In number of things were said, but if you look at the banking system right now, it has changed a lot. With no reduction of manpower, the manpower has remained same. And whenever you talk about any artificial intelligence, ultimately it is a question of how much intelligence the person who uh, you know who is developing artificial intelligence system is having. So when we are talking about say automation of IRAC norms, it means that a person who is a software you know developer, he should be well versed with the norms. He should be able to interpret the RBA norms, and he need to convert that into what is expected by the regulator. Now there is a missing link in you know all these uh, scenarios, and you know as a domain expertise, we can always pitch in into that. That wherever the flaws are there in the process, wherever we are able to give value addition in that. Every audit requires a value addition. They don't require only critical, uh, you know, comments on that. They want a solution of, uh, you know, also related to that. So as far as bank audit monopoly is concerned, even though institute is representing, or even though there will be a lot of representation which will go, don't presume that the days which were there ten years back which will remain. We are already having, you know, pooling period which is there. So many of us must be having, uh, you know, pooling period for a larger period, which was not there earlier. So we were getting kind of used to that. That we'll get this kind of work every year, and we can sustain based on that, uh, you know, throughout the years. So in days to come, actually, we need to be always on our toes. We need to keep on adopting the system. We need to have training systems to adopt new knowledge. And another important thing is that suppose say I am not doing say insurance audit. I'm just giving an example. It doesn't mean that I should not be aware about the insurance sector. There are ample opportunities which are available in each and every area. Like bank audit is a specialized area, insurance audit is also a specialized area, NBFC audits are is a specialized area. Everywhere opportunities are there, and to be very frank with you, as compared to bank audits, the other areas like you know NBFCs or insurance sector, there are lesser number of auditors who are really into that place. So wherever you know there is a lesser number is there, the opportunity exists actually. Another part is that we need to also start adopting automation at our offices because most of our offices we are. Practically everything in manual mode. Only thing is that typewriter has been replaced by computers. Maybe to certain extent, calculator have got replaced with Excel sheets, but otherwise automation is really lacking. I will give a couple of examples of that, and how the banks are also changing. I will also talk about that. Let me give a simple example of attendance system. We don't have an automated attendance system at most of our offices. The industry has already gone much beyond that. Like there are certain uh, systems or applications which are. There. Wherein you can mark the attendance using the uh, geo tag, you don't really require a swipe or a signature related to that. Now I am mentioning that at this point. There are applications wherein wherever you are conducting bank audit, like say stock audit is conducted by you, and if you want to prove that you have done a visit at that particular places, there are applications available wherein you can click the photograph of the places which you have visited. Then it stores the data related to date, time, and geographical location of that. So suppose tomorrow something goes wrong. You have ample evidence with you that on so and so date you have visited that particular place, and you have verified that uh, you know particular place with stock book dates, and you know the, you have met the a person over there. Now this is nothing but kind of advanced uh, stage as far as audit documentation is concerned. So we need to keep on embracing to the new uh, you know technologies which are adopted. Uh, audit working paper file is fine, but that is changing the form. It's no more a, a kind of a manual or a physical form. There are certain things which you need to maintain on in non-physical form. Then the storage becomes a, a, a you know a little tricky thing. How much you know how many uh, how much period you need to store? Uh, to be very frank with you, we don't have a robust uh, IT system also which is inbuilt in our uh, you know offices. So let me ask you one simple thing: 
how many of us really can install windows on our pcs we don't even know that actually you know as to what kind of security levels which we are uh, required to do and at the same time at the bank audit level we are seeing that we are equipped with it system and uh, we are able to do iso audit. so it's better that we face the hard reality take a pause maybe for a period of say one year two year equip ourselves and then enter into the area which is you no know, fast in why am you know saying it at length is we are lagging behind as far as training goes and upgradation of technologies go we are good in interpretation we are good in adopting uh, certain things wherever the laws undergo change we are the first person which typically we adopt the laws we are the typical people who find out loopholes in that it's high time that we should not be doing that actually we should embrace that along with technology try to re reduce the manual intervention another thing is that uh, now when you are talking about the branch audit one major change which has occurred especially for the large branches a uh, large uh, firm actually is that there is a paragraph 4 in that particular circular if you are reading that circular what the circular says is once you accept a assignment as central auditor or as a branch auditor that assignment will remain with you for a continuous period of 4 years so it's a kind of a contractual arrangement now the challenge over there is if suppose my firm is eligible for central secretary auditor category if i accept a branch audit i will not be eligible to accept any central audit in that particular period so it's a reciprocal actually it's not going in one way so it might pinch few for obvious reasons but at the same time again to retrain we need to adopt and we need to digest that there is no monopoly which can really exist as far as any ca firm is concerned or as far as the profession is concerned so this is one major change which has occurred which was not there earlier and uh, this change uh, it's very unlikely that it will get reversed so once you get into that you are sure that you are there for four years unless and until you become ineligible because of any of the criteria now what is the advantage of that even this circular was there earlier also that no one was able to remove you so always keep in your mind that your independence is always intact your independence is in a way getting jeopardized to the extent that audit is choosing the auditor as to who will audit my bank so uh, that's something which uh, ultimately is a call of the regulator uh, we can't uh, really go beyond that because the difference between any corporate audit and uh, a bank audit is that in corporate audits at least agm is there for bank audits especially public sector banks it's appointed by the management so we don't have that kind of a scenario but consider or compare that with your own practice ultimately your client is only appointing you so there is nothing new about uh, that particular thing and when we talk about public money and other thing uh, from professional perspective there is a limitation on how much we can argue so it's better to uh, you know accept that fact now as far as the impanelment process is concerned whenever you are impaneling uh, i have a couple of suggestions related to that because uh, as far as impanelment is concerned right now we are having only two major impanelments one is mef and another one is uh, rbi so that we impanel our firm read that faqs related to that impanelment clearly if you are having a, a partnership firm wherein the partner is into other firm and if both firms impanel both firms are debarred and you don't get weightage for that particular partner also even if one firm is impaneling over there now as far as the practice scenario is concerned across india and uh, i won't bar any uh, particular uh, city or any location for that we are having multiple smaller firms which are there across india and that's where uh, practically the profession is losing the uh, you can say uh, the collective intellect the reason is that just take a case hypothetically that suppose there are 100 sole proprietorship firms half of the time you are spending in doing administration job to see that you know who should be recruited at your firm how to retain that employee how to train that employee how to do attendance marking of that employee i don't have to really list it down now what really happens is if there are 100 firms 100 people are spending time in that only just imagine a scenario that even if it is reduced to 25 firms there is a massive you know saving of manpower second thing is that when you are coming together either by way of networking or by way of uh, partnership firm you have nothing to lose in the sense you can always have your own practice own setup which can remain intact till the time you are really gelling with each other now what is the benefit of that the benefit is not about impanelment because impanelment is comparatively a very small pie out of the entire practice because if you compare impanelment especially cnig impanelment i don't have to say anything about uh, you know the scale of fees which we are getting so let's not talk about that all of us are well aware of that that it's a kind of a charitable business which we are doing whenever we are accepting the cnig audit we don't have that uh, kind of fee structure also to support that now 
as far as empowerment is concerned it is on the one side second thing is that if any one of us is getting a bigger work let's say that there is a listed entity which wants to give work to any ci in vijayawada how many of us can really accept that kind of a work forget about when you will get but suppose there is an open opportunity that there is one listed entity who wants ca from vijayawada only you will you know think twice before accepting such assignment so first is that we need to equip ourselves that we have sufficiency of mind power and then only we should you know think about why we are not getting the bigger work or you know work which is really remunerative there are a couple of things about that also what we really always uh, think about or uh, get attached too much about is our name that you know we always feel that the firm name should have my name also or you know my initial no you know imagine a case wherein if you have been said 20 partners can you really have you know that kind of a big name which is difficult to pronounce in any form you know whether you go short form or long form and uh, think about you know other other things also take an example of any bigger corporate or a bigger uh, you know ca firm the person who are running that uh, show they they don't own that surname or you know brand name like say a person in say tata group may not be a you know uh, having a surname as tata but still you know there is a lot of respect which is given to that person because the respect comes along with the knowledge it's not related to the brand name or anything which is created think about you know any big four firm there is no surname which is there whatever name is there maybe when it was formed that time maybe four or five partners might be together who have formed that but now actually no one is really thinking about that or no one will really bother if uh, someone wants to join say, you know just to give an example like suppose someone of you is given an offer to join a big four or a bigger indian firm can you really put an obstacle by saying that no my name should be added and then only i will join just extend that same logic to yourself decide amongst yourself whenever you want to come together as to whose name you really want to retain and what is the reason and somewhere you know you have to uh, uh, take a step backwards by not insisting on that because otherwise you will never get into a progressive mode you will again stick to that 100 form scenario doing half of the time spending in administrative work which is futile and uh, i'm little blunt in saying that because that is that's what is happening across india unfortunately uh, cas i don't know the reasons for that but lawyer firms uh, you know typically come together very quickly as compared to ca firms i don't know the reasons for that but that's what is really happening we are good in accounting terms so we can do branch accounting for our clients but when it comes to us like suppose four of us are coming together we we say that we can't do that branch accounting you know it will be a mess uh, so we need to graduate ourselves something beyond that Now let me just correlate that with bank branch audit. See, whenever you want to do a bank branch audit in the limited period, now when I'm saying limited period, many a times you know we always criticize the bank audit by saying that it has to be completed in three or four days, but that is not the reality. Those of you who are doing audit, just ask yourself as to what was the date when you got the appointment letter, and what was the date when we started off with the audit. There is a huge gap between that because we have other work to conclude before March. End. So even if we get the appointment on twenty fifth. we end up in starting the audit only th- uh, you know on 3rd or 4th of april and then we say that we have to submit the report on 8th of april no one has stopped you to immediately start the work so if you are getting the appointment letter on 25th only formality which you need to complete is send acceptance letter to them whenever the branches are conveyed to you because typically they will first ask your consent if you are if you are a new auditor otherwise the consent is not asked and then they will give the branches the moment you get the letter of branches you can immediately communicate to the previous auditor which most of the banks are providing you these details at the time of appointment itself so you don't have to again ask for them call up that particular firm because even those details are typically available and uh, nowadays actually through google most of the things are available so make use of that opt in noc once noc is with you practically you can start the audit immediately from next next minute also even if the bank is resisting you not to start the audit put that in writing to the bank by saying that if you are not allowing me to initiate the audit process we will not be able to complete the audit during that particular time frame because once you are appointed you have every access to that audit books of accounts and every record of audit now what we can really do is as far as the advances you know verification is concerned that is something which we can very well do prior to 31st march we can identify doubtful accounts in the sense which we feel that they are likely to be npa and prepare ourselves to verify that maybe on 1st or 2nd of april so that our half of the work can be you know prepared now for this what we really require is sufficient manpower now when we are talking about sufficient manpower i have seen in many whatsapp group wherein uh, it is categorically 
few people you know start posting in this particular season that i am available for any one self and all these things uh, remember one thing that whenever you are accepting any assignment no subletting is permitted if it is revealed there can be a disciplinary action on you see it might get revealed maybe uh, there might be a chance of only 1% that someone will complain against you but do you really want to uh, put your degree at stake at 1% is something which you need to ask yourself the reason we yeah sure sir Let's say I'm there. I will not get an audit, but my friend got an audit. Can I accompany him to do the audit? Sir, it is subletting. I will tell you the reason. I will give you the reason. See, in your appointment letter, it is always stated that the firm will carry out the job. So you take him as an employee, take him on his on your own, which is not possible. <laughs> see, come, see, when you sign NDA with that bank, non-disclosure agreement specifies that the information will be given only to that firm, no one else. So that is something uh, which you are going against NDA. See, why I am warning also, I will tell you. I know that many of the firms are doing this uh, kind of a practice. Be aware about the repercussion. You need to be aware about the risk which you are running with, you know, whenever you are carrying out this job. And that's why I said that when we are having multiple proprietorship firms or multiple smaller firms, I should say, not in terms of knowledge. I will never say that anyone is short of any knowledge. Problem is with the manpower. We don't have sufficient manpower. Like suppose earlier we used to get three audits or even proprietorship firm. In practical scenario, let's be uh, you know uh, view that independently as we do for you know our audits. Do we uh, do that firm really carry uh, can be uh, really carrying out this assignment on their own? And if the answer is big no, we shouldn't be even cribbing about reduction of uh, you know, number of branches because that's what has happened actually over the year wherein we have not uh, I should say learned ourselves to say no to our client. I will give you again one example. See, we get this such a such kind of assignment by empanelment. Now, I will just compare that with, say, GST audit, which used to be there. Suppose, as a firm, you have never practiced in GST. So, you are not practicing in GST. But tomorrow, GST department comes out with an empanelment process and you get three audits. Will you really be uh, even daring to sign that audit? And the answer is a little difficult to give, actually. So, compare that, that whenever you are accepting the assignment, are you really equipped to accept that assignment? Do you have that, uh, I, I should not say domain expertise, but at least expert level to do that particular audit? And what kind of process which you are following to ensure that you are equipped with that kind of a knowledge? Whether you are doing bank audit or not is a different scenario. But if you want to be there in banking practice, there has to be a conscious effort which you need to do. Throughout the year, you need to equip yourself. You may not get any audit, or you might be doing only say stock audit of a couple of units. Maybe doing a one concurrent audit, but that helps in keeping in touch with that you know that professional practice. Otherwise, it's really difficult. So imagine a situation that for entire year you have never filed GST return. At the end, you get a big you know company to file GST audit report. It's very difficult to uh, uh, you know realize uh, uh, you know even imagine this scenario. So my point is that wherever you want to do bank audit, first ask yourself that whether you are able to develop that team or not, and whether you are able to maintain that team. So I am saying maintain that team is we need to also think about the retaining of manpower. Now, how you can retain that manpower is that first is naturally, you know, salary part, which I would talk about because that is something which is in, uh, not in our head. We can't match industry standard. Now, what is the reason why we can't industry standard? The answer lies in the way we are doing the practice. We accept each and every work irrespective of the fees. So if someone says that I will pay you only 500, still we say yes. Someone says we are, you know, giving five thousand. Still, we say, you know, we, we never say no to anyone. We are not, we are not running a charitable, charitable organization. Check one point as to how much manpower you are spending to issue any certificate, any report, or under undertaking any work. Now, the immediate, you know, question which might arise in your mind is that if I lose or if I start losing my client, what should I do? I will give you a simple example. Suppose I am having say hundred clients. Paying may say 1,000 rupees you know, per year for whatever services, maybe income tax return or anything. If I increase my fees to say 1,500 and if I lose my 50% of the client also, I'm almost at par with what I'm doing with the limited manpower. Always keep this in uh, your mind. I'm sure that you know many of you have been practicing for years. Few of you have been recently started practice. Ask yourself as to how many clients left you because fees were on a higher side. The, the number is very less actually. No one leaves us for fees. Like, you know, if someone is trusting any doctor, no one leaves to, you know, to uh, that doctor and goes to uh, some adjoining doctor because he's charging less. This never happens. 
it depends upon what kind of service you are providing and what kind of comfort you are giving to your client and there are certain things which we need to educate our client also that our office timings are 10 to 6 and they are not 10 to 10 in the sense it's not 24 by 7 when he is supposed to call us or message us once you kind of educate him usually clients fall in line because see even they understand uh, you know that kind of scenario uh, they can compare on their own for their own business but since you are liberal uh, you are open always you know like a chemist shop which is open 24 by 7 and fortunately our practice is not such that uh, if we don't pick up the phone no one is going to die next day also the same scenario will be there why i'm saying all these things is we are stressing ourselves unnecessarily now again let me come back to the topic i'm a little drifting but i hope that you know i can uh, uh, talk liberally now when it comes to bank audit uh, presume that you want to accept a bank audit then first thing which you need to do is equip your office staff to undertake that bank audit. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone should be aware about everything. So imagine that you are getting one branch. Think about what should be the audit planning and how many uh, mandates are required and what is the type of manpower which is required. So just to give an example, suppose you are having a structure of one plus two in the sense one is CA or maybe a partner and two are assistant. So ideally, one might be a person who is comparatively new or comparatively less experienced so he can be given a work under your uh, under your delegated uh, you know observation that may be deposit related part p and l related part and other areas can be covered the second person who is there he might be good in certain areas maybe for generation of reports generation of exceptional report you are good in say uh, you know verifying uh, loans and advances file now practically if you start verifying all files on your own you will not train your staff also so there has to be some handholding which should happen so what you need to do is you need to have your basic checklist ready. So that, for example, if you want someone other than yourself to verify, say, housing loan file, you need to think about what all you as a you know partner would have checked in that particular file. So maybe there are common 15 common points are there. So you prepare a chart of that in maybe, say, in singular page. Ask that person to verify that and maybe put a tick or write something. Just to give an example, like, say, suppose in case of a housing loan, there will be an application there will be a sanction letter, there will be a original agreement on the record. If it is a registered mortgage, there might be a registered mortgage here. So just jot down all points which are possible points. The person will only tick that you know box, that whether it is adverse or uh, you know non-adverse. So you can have that shaded column also, that whichever is adverse comment, that is shaded. So the person who is ticking that is aware that you know I'm pointing out something which is adverse. Make that person also write certain amount, maybe say sanction amount or say loan number, or maybe date of that particular document. So while writing, he you know he becomes aware that there is something amiss. Like suppose he is writing an amount on the top of that. Back of his mind, suppose he has written say fifty lakhs. Verify you know when he is verifying every document, that fifty lakhs is always uh, you know to his back of his mind. Don't rely beyond the, beyond the point on Excel and other things. Virtual things they are very difficult to digest. When you write down, there is always a difference to just you know fill up the Excel spreadsheet and to write down something. So make a mix and match of your manual as well as your automated system. I am not saying that everything should be handwritten. So the format can be well drafted, wherein minimum things are handwritten. But the person who is doing that, he becomes conscious whenever he is writing something. I will give one example of that. Suppose I make so, you know any statement from this dials, and if I am asked to write down, write it down, and then sign it off, then I should be able to do that. Same thing happens with the bank ver uh, audit verification process. That if, if you are taking the reporting of a person, he will say that I have seen everything. Now, if you ask me that, you know, just write down what you have you know, verified, it becomes very ticklish thing. I will give you another example related to bank audit. All of us are doing cash verification, whether we are doing any audit, whether it is concurrent or whether it is uh, statutory. We issue the certificate of cash verification. How many of us have really verified cash in entirety? We always do on a test check basis. But what we write is something different. We say that physic we have conducted physical verification, and you know it is found correct. It is even not, see this kind of certificate is always true and correct. It is not true and fair. We cannot say that approximately that was the cash. That is not the intention. Now the moment if you start doing that, typically the bankers might uh, you know start resisting you. You can simply tell him that okay, if you don't want us to verify that, we will put it in certificate. No banker will accept that certificate. Imagine a scenario that you are certifying by saying that out of say one crore, you only verified 10 lakhs. No one will accept your certificate. So whatever you are writing, wherever you are signing, think twice before doing that. Suppose tomorrow it is revealed, 
that the bundles were missing and it is proved beyond the point that earlier uh, no, earlier itself the bundles were not there you might be held responsible chances are 0.001% but do you really want to be party of that is something which you need to ask same way wherever you are issuing any certificate see there are n number of certificates which we issue like say education loan related certificates are there interest subvention certificates are there how many of us verify files even on test check basis before issuing the certificate or do we rely entirely on the system by taking the system dump we convert that into excel apply certain formulas and we presume that whatever is done is correct i will just give ticklish examples about that you know where we can go wrong let's take an example of education loan let's presume that you are doing a branch where in say 200 education loans are there and there is some government scheme is there which you have to certify during your tenure like say you are doing audit of say 20 to 23 financial year let's presume that there is no education loan is there so that doesn't appear in your sample data wherever you are you know verifying the loan because typically all of us will take out pull out the list of loans which are renewed or sanctioned during the year so no education loan is there still you are certifying that uh, education loan interest subsidy or interest subvention now in that case at least make it a point to pull out maybe one or two files on a sample basis to ensure two things one is that the files are available for your verification and secondly what your presumption which you are going with that the data in system is true and correct you know based on that only we issue the certificate that is verified by you i am not saying that go through 100% files i will never suggest that but looking at one or two files per certificate is something which is a minimum thing which you need to do we cannot blindly issue a certificate because if that was the case our certification was not even warranted system would have only taken care of that see we are not here only to uh, you know test our excel knowledge you know that how we are applying our uh, you know formulas and whether we are able to convert text file into excel file or not that is not the intention intention is that rbi or government what they expect is we have verified that particular portion verification will be always on sample basis no one expects that you need to cover that on 100% basis so wherever certifications are there let's presume there are say 20 certifications are there whenever you receive the appointment letter draft the audit program wherein there is due uh, time which is given for that certification verification because typically otherwise at the end of the day when you are concluding the audit there will be 20 certificates which will be available in front of you and it's literally like you know you will come under pressure and sign it off so the best way is that when you start off with the audit first part we already discussed with that that when you accept the letter first is acceptance letter second one is seeking noc from the previous auditor third one is you need to issue a engagement letter see all these illustrative formats are there in bank audit guidance note you have to just copy paste and make certain changes related to that because those are illustrative in nature we you know none of uh, you know the uh, bank audit study group uh, member can do a all comprehensive format because it's always limited to certain extent so make it comprehensive which is suiting your needs section there is no prescribed format for any engagement letter acceptance letter it all are only guiding factors for you once you issue engagement letter the next thing which you need to do is prepare the list of requirements which you are having to start off with the audit so it can be n number of exceptional reports which you can list out the best way to uh, you know go along with that is see think about what are the deliverables from our end so there are major three or four deliverables are there one is your main audit report second is your lfr third one is certification and fourth one are moc these are the broadly uh, you know a deliverables moc is something which will evolve on the at the end based on how many mistakes the branch has done or how many queries which you have found out which are remaining unresolved but when you are talking about lfr for lfr for each and every pair or each and every question you need to correlate that with some system generated report which will form basis of starting the verification it is not a conclusive it it's a starting point so make a list of that give that list to that branch manager on the first day itself that is along with the engagement letter give him that list and say that these are the reports which i want now typically if you start before 31st march you can always ask the report of 20th february or 15th march you don't have to wait for 31st march because later on you can take that report and just you know compare that that there are no major variances are there but your work should not get hampered same way for certification also whichever report or whichever underlying documents which you require make a list of that and send that email to the branch now why i am insisting on sending an email is let's presume that you have sent an email on 25th and the branch is making you all these records available only on say 5th or 6th then you have every point to say that you will not complete the audit on 8th or 10th because there has to be sufficient time gap which should be available certificate will be getting out to 31st march let it be but you are aware about the format so you can pull out the data 
So that's why I said that, see, suppose up to 20th February, if you have the requirement of the reports which are there, certificates will be collated up to the 31st March is right. So ideally they should make you available on 1st of April, which rarely happens. They take time in compilation right. of that because there is a manual intervention is there. I have never seen a bank which generates automated certificates. They are web-based returns. So what they do is based on certain report which is generated through the system, the details are filled up. Now there is some verification process which you need to carry out because if, if it is a straight through process, we are not required. <laughs> you know, it's only MIS which is generated. So that process you need to verify as to whether the process is correct and sufficient or not. The competency check has to be there. Now, how you can do that is correlate every certification with the trial balance or GL which you get that whether everything is covered or not. And that too, opening and closing GL should be covered. Because based on that only, you will be aware about whether any particular type of certification is applicable to that branch or not. So and basically, yeah. basically, the information given you are after 31st March only, they are provided. Let them say that in writing. See, it's, it's their take actually. If they give me on 10th also, I'm fine with that because my checking will start on 10th. So I need to spell out clearly that whenever I will receive the information, then only I will be able to commence my work related to that area. So you are on a safer footing. So I will tell you the issue. Typically when that date, uh, date is nearing, there is a lot of pressure on central auditor also. A lot of pressure is there on bank also because everyone wants to publish balance sheet and maybe bank gold medal or first number is that. I don't know the reason for that, but that's what is happening. So that pressure is percolated till branch level. Now at branch level, suppose you are given a particular date, there has to be a sufficient time which you should be uh, you know, made available with. Now suppose you have insufficient manpower, then ca that can never be an excuse. So that's why first I said that we need to have sufficient manpower and then we can ask for sufficient time for that. Now how to prove that we didn't have sufficient time? See, there are certain banks which really provide that information because they are also now aware. So they have certain reports which are dumped in specific folder. So your 50 or 75% work is already over in terms of getting that report. Analysis is secondary part, but first you need to get that information. So if you don't get the information, then you have every right to extend your audit. But if information is available, avoid extending audit. You know, then it becomes a, a, a odd thing out, you know, like uh, one will point it out at you that only one person is sitting at a branch and doing the audit, which is not expected or two, only two persons are there. That is something which is not supposed to be done. Because for any other audit, we have ample manpower, you know, like say tax audit, we spend a lot of time. We have sufficient manpower. When it comes to bank audit, suddenly it gets eroded to one, two, maximum three. Don't let that happen actually. So that was the real point. Now, when you do this uh, documentation process, in the documentation, what really happens is the moment you start conversing with the branch, uh, you know, manager, it becomes your uh, part of audit documentation file. So suppose you come across any query related to any loan or you know any odd thing about your PNL account or any qualification which you are proposing to put in your report or in your LFAR, make it a point that at the end of the day, there are certain queries which according to you have already freezed or communicated to the branch manager. Invariably mention at the end of that email, specify that you want a representation about you know the discrepancy which you have stated from the branch and give maybe one day or two days. Specify the date or uh, you know day also. Like today, if you have given the query, mention that by tomorrow end of the day, we will require a representation from you about our query. And if that is not received, we are presuming that you are agreeing with our views. What happens is the moment you start sending such emails, there is an indirect pressure also on the branch to reply you back. So your last process that is about the conclusion of the audit becomes a kind of an easy affair. Because then no one can tell you that you have never told us this query and this is a last moment query, you know, all these things can be really avoided. So that's also the point as to why I'm saying that keep a habit of sending an email. Email is an easier way to communicate than to give a letter in the writing because it creates a little bit of bitterness. You know, if you ask them to acknowledge, uh, you can see the faces which are made, you know, like uh, it's like, you know, whether you don't trust us and all these things will start. Even if you have certain verbal discussions also which are carried out, make it a point to minimize that Send it as minutes of discussion so that whatever views you have taken or the branch views are there, they're written and they're documented. Mention at the end that this is the minutes of discussion related to say so and so account or so and so query. And if there is any uh, other view or anything is missed out, you know, they can uh, point it out. If it doesn't point it out, the branch manager doesn't point it out, our job is simple. That whatever we are having an opinion that gets crystallized, we don't have to again argue with that. 
Now, as far as bank order preparedness is concerned, uh, one way to do that, not only for bank audit, but otherwise is that, one is the institute seminar forum, which we are always having. Another thing is that start developing faculties within your firm. What I mean by developing faculties is that, suppose you are having, say, staff of 10 persons, say, two are uh, good in income tax, two are good in GST, two are good in company audits, two are good in bank audit. Let them speak up at the, uh, your internal meetings. Try to conduct joint training sessions also, maybe with three or four close firms which can come together for this kind of a, 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 you know, a training. What happens is, the moment if you want to speak about any topic, you need to start preparing yourself. You know, even think about the smallest thing. If you want to give a lecture for ETDS filing of return, you are doing it by practice over the years. But if you want to, uh, you know, impart the training, first is you will do, uh, read that section rule. What is the interest quantum? What is per day penalty? You will always quote everything. So once you become habitual to that, uh, you know, it becomes an easier thing to become expert in that subject. Uh, initially, you know, uh, uh, Chairman Sir and Vice Chairman Sir were you know, telling about speakers. That is the reality why speakers are here. So it's not about uh, getting any remuneration otherwise. It's easy to keep in uh, touch with the uh, academic part. And uh, uh, since this topic is there, uh, uh, let me just tell you one thing that I've never seen any speaker who expects anything as far as institute forum is concerned. And most of the speakers don't speak anywhere else. I rarely speak at any uh, other places, barring a couple of banks wherein I had been there as a, a faculty for their training. One of that was SBI, wherein uh, long back SBI had conducted one joint uh, training wherein institute was involved. So that was the reason why I was there. See, the reason is that uh, ultimately someone has to give some time for institute also. Uh, there are advantages for that. One is for institute, it's always good. Second is for you also, it is good, you know, that you have to prepare with yourself on that. Like suppose when I'm standing before you for bank audit seminar, I need to be equipped myself at least to the level of say 70 or 80 percent of bank audit. No one can be 100 percent accurate. No one is even supposed to know 100 percent of any subject. That is something which one one has to uh, accept and digest. Actually, you know, you cannot be master of everything, but it's good to be master of few you know areas than to become master of none by you know putting your hands in uh, everything. So when you start preparing your staff about that, when you hold discussions throughout the year maybe one hour every week is also more than sufficient. It's not that you require ample time. So over the period, you will get to prepare yourself for a particular area. It can be bank audit, it can be any other area. And there are always, you know, cross knowledge sharing, which can happen. Like, for example, if you're aware about GST rules, you can apply that while doing bank audit. I will give you a simple example in that. Like in case of GST in the last financial year, that is current financial year, there was a, a circular which was issued related to locker rent. I don't know how many of you have come across that. In locker rent in many banks, locker rent is recorded on cash basis, right? You must have seen that. GST expects that to pay GST liability on accrual basis. So uh, if you are equipped with GST knowledge, you have a good point which you can raise by quoting that particular circular. So there is always a cross knowledge which is required. Like suppose you are not aware about, uh, say, Cairo. You can't do bank audit because the appraisal part, in appraisal part, financials of the borrowers are always there. You should be able to read and interpret that. So it's not that you should be aware only about bank audit or only about a particular area. It's a variety of knowledge which you need to possess. And you should be uh, at least at par or maybe above par to the, to the extent of knowledge with the bankers are having. Then only you can do the audit. And again, I'm saying that you should not be master of all. So what I mean to say is that, suppose you're having a bank power of three persons deputed at a branch, divide the areas amongst yourself. That maybe suppose you are the person who is good in drafting, Make it a point that at the end of the day, you take the reporting of the entire audit team. You are drafting the points at that point itself. Convey those drafted points to the branch so that one by one, your you know audit report is also prepared parallelly. So for example, LFAR, if you are having LFAR, which is system generated, that is, which is fed in the system, maintain manual LFAR for updation. So at the end, when you uh, crystallize that LFAR, you can start feeding into that. You don't have to you know, spend time in feeding that because there are some banks wherein you cannot generate the LFR which is already fit. If that facility is there, you can make use of that. But as and when you finish off a line item in LFR or a line item in say certification or deliverables, one by one, your audit will start closing. So you also have an indicator as to how much work is spending. So suppose LFR is having say 100 line items. Every end of the day, you should be aware about out of 100, how many points are covered. So first day, all not applicable will get covered. So you get a kind of a, a comfort uh, you know, level that at least 20 I have covered because they are not applicable. But start with that. Somewhere you need to start you know, related to that. 
So same way, if you are getting two branches, you need to have two uh, independent team which can cater to the need of manpower at those places. If you have a single team of three persons doing two branches, practically it is not possible for you to complete the audit. Ask yourself whether you want to accept such assignments or not. There is no point in subsequently creeping that I am not able to complete the work because I don't get sufficient time. The reality is different. Actually, we have sufficient time. We don't have sufficient manpower. We need to come closer to that uh, you know, acceptance. Secondly, uh, whenever we are talking about uh, type of manpower, uh, I know that day by day articles, uh, you know, are decreasing, uh, vanishing. Yeah, that's a, that is a better word actually. See, think about the reasons for that. There are, according to me, there are two reasons for that. One is that uh, as a profession, uh, we are not looked upon as uh, a profession which is paying handsomely. Uh, that's what is the presumption. That is not the reality. It depends upon what kind of practice or what kind of uh, industry uh, you know one enters into. The reason why practice is becoming a sort of, uh, I should say, inattractive attractive is that firstly, whenever anyone gets into CA profession, he should be uh, uh, fond of that profession. You know, as always, you can't survive. Otherwise, it becomes just a degree. So there is a difference in that. If the articles are not coming, think in other way that after 10 years, you will be the only auditors who are left out. So there is a scarcity of auditor which has already started happening. If you look at the existing scenario, in days to come, there will be scarcity of auditor. At the same time, we will always enjoy certain kind of monopoly in terms of eligibility to sign off a particular thing. Why I'm saying eligibility is that I'm barring away the impalement process. I'm not even uh, wish to touch upon that. But we have ample of work. Even if you talk about simple income tax consultancy, think about how many income tax uh, you know return filers are there. AIS, EIS, 26AS, pre-filled form, everything has a limitation. Someone has to validate it. Because data flow has to be validated with the reality. Think about, you know, any number of notices which are issued. I'm sure that here also you must be receiving notices from 10, 11 financial year wherein outstanding areas are there. We need to adopt a practice wherein there is nothing free service, kind of a free service which you are giving to our client. Otherwise, let him file his own return. The moment he file return for one year, next day he will pay you twice and come back to you. I have never seen any person who has, uh, you know, uh, stop filing returns, at least in our form. Because... If I ask yourself also that without taking any assistant, assistance of your uh, articles or employees, can you file your own return? Uh, it's a ticklish thing to ask actually. We ourselves cannot you know, understand that. So what kind of utility is provided and whether it is sufficient, uh, you know, whether we are uh, filling up all the details in that or not. So all of us are using software, most of us, but still we are little uncertain as to whether the software is working correctly as per the latest utility or, uh, utility or not. So this applies equally to the uh, you know income tax return filers also. There is ample opportunity. So when you are preparing uh, your staff, what is about creating the uh, domain expertise? Now how to create domain expertise as far as bank audits are concerned? I will talk a little about that. See, whenever you are signing off any branch audit report, what you are certifying is only trial balance. You don't certify balance sheet and PNL because you don't have notes on accounts. So what you certify is only true and fair. Uh, I should say a limited to a true and fair view about your GL level balances. If you look at any branch, there is no PNL which you are really certifying because it is not accompanied with notes on accounts. It is only you can say a formatted part of GL, you know, which can be uh, formatted in a different way. Some banks have straight away GL only. So when you are writing audit report, read that audit report carefully as to on what you know or what you are really certifying. It, it shouldn't have notes on accounts because at branch level notes on accounts doesn't exist. If notes on accounts are not there, it's not a full set of financial statements. It's a limited set actually, you know, which you are certifying. So look, have a look at that. Secondly, when you want to enrich your knowledge, first ask yourself whether you are aware about the balance sheet and PNL format or not. The format is there in Banking Regulation Act. Make yourself and your uh, assistant acquainted, well acquainted with that. Because whenever you are looking at GL level, Ultimately, it is going to percolate and get grouped into a balance sheet or PNL act. Now, the grouping is very vital. There might be certain instances wherein ledger balance is distorted as compared to what is grouped. I will give one example of that. See, there are certain banks which are coming out with innovative products. And uh, you need to understand that how that will get ultimately presented in balance sheet and how the IRAC norms are applied to that. So let me give you a simple example. Suppose you are having a housing loan product wherein drop line OD is given to that particular borrower. So it's a housing loan, but it, which is given in the form of drop line OD. So checkbook is issued. 
So whenever a droplet in OD facility is given, which works exactly in the same way as housing loop, like say 180, uh, you know, months are there. So over 180 months, your limit will gradually decrease. What is expected is at any given point of time, upon balance should be below that decrease limit, which will be dropped. Now, when you are applying this norm to IRAC norms, term load related norms will not be applicable to this product because it's OD product. So let me give you an example. Like suppose there is a person who has taken this drop line OD uh, kind of housing loan. He prepays 12 installments. So he has paid that lump sum. So presume that it is a term loan account. So what will happen is for next 12 months, even if he doesn't pay anything, his account is still regular because he has prepaid. So his ledger balance is below the ideal DP. No portion of overdues. No question of marking that account as even SMA category because he's below the limit or within that particular uh, this uh, ideal drawing power. Now think about overdraft account. In overdraft account, out of order uh, you know, will be applicable. So what will happen is the moment 90 days are over and if there are no credits in the account, the account will turn into NPA. So there are certain banks, what they do is they have product code which is defined under OD because checkbook cannot be issued otherwise as far as the CPA system goes. But for IRAC norms, they apply the norms of Tumblr. Now, this kind of uh, combination is not supposed to work because I cannot you know, say that for OD facility, I will apply the Tumblr uh, related IRAC norms. And again, there is a question of grouping also because in case of advances, the grouping is into three parts. One is build discounting, second one is Tumblr, third one is CCOD. So I have to fit that product in one of these three uh, conditions. Now, when I'm saying that in grouping, it is CCOD, if that is the case, then naturally IRI norms will be related to CCOD and the system should work in that fashion. Now, I don't know for what reason CBS will give me an option to apply different direct norms for a you know, product which otherwise is a OD product, but that's what systems do. So that's the reason why I said that you should be aware about how the system is working. Even if the systems are automated, but if there are all kinds of flexibility which is provided to the system, then it's a flexible system. You know, it's not following the norms. So be vigilant about that as to how that GL will ultimately end up in compliance of IRAC norms or related to certification. Also the same thing, you know, something similar will apply. That it depends upon the time. Uh, there is a Mexican account in State Bank of India, but similar accounts are there across the banking sector. This product was there in HSBC also. This product is there in Standard Chartered Bank also. Uh, see, I actually these no even other one almost all see this product is very popular because if you are having surplus funds you can park in the account. See from borrower side is not at fault. Suppose you are a borrower, they will put that, but in term loan you cannot withdraw back that amount. So drop line OD that is a facility. So I don't have to even maintain saving account. I will not keep any FD in that account. Uh, Sweep account it's not sweep account. The entire account goes there. See, if they are maintaining balance in two sides and then compensating and calculating the interest, it's fine. But then about presentation also, there is a question raised that whether you will show advance at a gross level or whether we will net it off. So that's why I said that think about how the balance sheet presentation will be and how the IRAC norms will be compliant. So it's not that this practice will always be continued in a, a wrongful manner. Banks will keep on correcting these practices. But that's why I said that when you are carrying out an audit, think about what kind of value addition which you can make. In a sense, if there is a flaw in the system, which you can prove logically, which is going against the RBS circular, better to point it out and highlight it at the highest level. See, because there is no fault on the borrower side also, which all of us know that from borrower's angle, he has prepaid the 12 installments. But the product is not explained to him. That's that's a reality. Or out of order status conditions are different. Now, we cannot challenge why this condition exists. See, we cannot be practical bankers or we cannot be practical auditors. We are theoretical auditors only because we are we are governed by RBI regulations. And when it comes to regulation, it's theoretical only. How a regulation can be a practical regulation? You know, there can't be something like that. So you have to stick to the law. Suppose tomorrow RBI gives an exemption from such categories. It's fine. But let that regulator say that. We are not in a position to interpret the law the way the bank wants or the way it suits to the uh, you know auditor. Let's not get into that judgmental position. So if there is a flaw, that has to be cured. And there are ways to cure that actually. It's not that the, that is not curable. But then that is something which the audit has to think about. Our job is different. And secondly, we are not consulted when we are talking about statutory audit. 
always distinguish between that whenever you are advising something to the bank think twice that whether you are doing that correctly as a part of statutory audit process or not you can help the bank but not as a consultant that area is altogether different don't you need to curing of a product or something or that's a point out the lack you know let them take the decision whichever suits them we are not here to uh, you know challenge the credit uh, portfolio or the credit decisions of the bank we shouldn't be even doing that actually now coming back to again uh, manpower training so first is developing the uh, expertise of banking so make everyone aware about how the balance sheet and pnl of any bank looks like uh, you know at the end what is written in the notes on account now and to what extent such notes are applicable to the branch all notes may not be applicable but maybe six or seven notes on accounts will be there which you need to verify at the branch level to just confirm that you know they are applied applied uh, uniformly the second thing is that nowadays everything is automated and all these things so uh, there is a presumption that you can take dump of uh, certain reports convert it into to excel and you know your uh, job will be done i have certain reservations about that the reason is that as far as usage of excel is concerned it is always having certain limitations there are a couple of limitations which i would like to spell it out first thing is that it's always a manual process so it depends upon the person who is developing that excel spreadsheet so for example if you are developing a complex uh, excel spreadsheet with lot of formulas and if that person tomorrow is not there in your firm you will not be even able to uh, you know understand that spreadsheet and to use that spreadsheet the way that person might have thought because there are various ways to uh, interpret the data and to use that data there is another way uh, you know to use certain tools there are cat tools which are available and uh, cat tools to uh, just give you a couple of example what cat tools do, do actually they maintain the audit trail of whatever work or whatever data crunching which you are uh, doing so it's a process which gets recorded and you can do a repeated process also so it's it's a kind of uh, semi programming techniques which you can apply over there which you can prove also at a later stage that you have carried out this job at so and so date and at so and so place and you can also prove that what was your data source is there now the same job which excel does actually there are predefined procedures which are there in cat tools think about starting using of these cat tools rather than completely relying on excel excel is good training uh, you know material or you know training tool but nothing beyond that we cannot prove that on which day i have carried out a particular process it's very difficult to do that there is a high chance that if your excel file gets corrupted or if there is no uh, competency check which you have carried out you may not be even able to use that second thing is that there is a line item limitation on excel suppose you are having a huge database with you you cannot process that in entirety through excel so try to think about cat tools not only for bank audit but for other purposes also so what are the cat tools are available so there are multiple cat tools are there institute is also having a tie up with couple of uh, software vendors it is there on uh, institute website also uh, the tie up i know one tie up arrangement but that is just the example which i am uh, giving because uh, the training is also carried out at institute level for those cat tools there is idea uh, software which is there uh, there is offer which is given to cs for normal cases it is 1 lakh rupee per year that's what is for corporates means anyone other than ca for cs uh, what i recall is that for first year it is 50000 and then it is 10000 per year so it's not that costly but the good part about that is it is able to handle any type of document like suppose you are having a pdf dump so let me just give you an example of say tally dump you know all ledger accounts are there or uh, bank statements are there why do you even go to tally uh, plain bank statement are there in which, is, which are in uh, pdf form you can predefine by removing predefined criteria for removing of header converting that into columnar form and you can repeat that process you don't have to again rerun anything it's a predefined uh, you know kind of a thing which you can carry out it's capable of handling all types of uh, files jpg file pdf file word file text file ascii file any you know file you name now the advantage of that is first is that it creates a audit documentation for uh, for you that how you have done that job so tomorrow no one can question you as to whether you have carried out a particular process or not because that that gets recorded and it is retrievable you can uh, you know demonstrate that before any authority also as to you have taken uh, sufficient care or not secondly it is having certain uh, you know fuzzy logic, logic procedures wherein there are certain uh, inbuilt procedures are there which are difficult to uh, you know uh, program in excel so those those are readily available like say for example just to give a simple example pivot tables or indexing and other things those are available as a kind of an inbuilt tools 
you don't have to uh, you know formulate those things and pull out certain details so think something beyond what all of us are doing right now try to reduce the manual intervention try to reduce dependency on a person dependency on a software is comparatively better because software will continue yeah i will tell you the problem over there bankers are not ready to share the data but same logic applies to excel also so whatever we are able to do through excel only to that extent we are able to do but at the same time what we can do is whenever we are getting any exceptional reports if you want to check that or if you want to filter out and pull out certain details we can have that done i will give one example let's presume that you want to analyze the defaulter statement and let's say that bank gives you 365 days defaulter statement i'm just giving a hypothetical example uh and now let's compare that in excel you will pull 365 worksheets then with using one data key field you might have columnar form like you know against every loan uh, you will do that here actually if you compare that once you set a procedure for one spreadsheet for that text file you know how to convert that and make it in a column form you can devise the form which you want after you know pulling 365 uh, worksheets you don't take time in that only hitch about uh, these tools is you need to train yourself in that uh, but that is uh, in reality that is a real future think about you know earlier days when excel were not excel was not there i'm sure that many of you have experienced that earlier lotus was there to begin with prior to lotus full scripts were there so gradually we have come to an age where we have started using excel it's a kind of extension to that uh, learning process in days to come gradually all the data will be made available to you as they are making you available to certain extent or limited extent which you are using on excel think a step beyond that don't confine yourself and satisfied about the excel tools and how good you are in formulas in excel that is something which is already think of past and you can make use of this for anything actually i will give another example suppose you are having salary spreadsheets and you want to file profession tax return or any return related to salary or say etds return same job which you are doing through excel maybe you know pulling the data on a monthly basis or this thing that can be done with a click of a button actually you don't only point out to those files which are similarly formatted and it's a repetitive job it takes uh, you know much lesser time as it is required for uh, you know uh, doing through excel because excel the problem is that if your file size goes beyond the size uh, it doesn't work uh, to that extent it becomes a sluggish process actually here these are specified or these are specially made tools are there so it's simpler but there are multiple uh, cat tools are available not only idea but to begin with somewhere it's better to go with institute type so our cost is reduced or it is uh, confined to a limited extent but start equipping your staff in that now let me give you another advantage of uh, you know getting a proficiency in cat tools so right now uh, most of us are thinking that we can confine our practice only to vijayawada or maybe to surrounding area am i right Uh, then it's good that you know you if you already expand see now the challenge over here is whenever you are restricting geographically nowadays geographical restrictions are no more there so think beyond uh, your existing circle or existing comfort zone if you uh, you know get into i'm not saying you should immediately uh, you know jump into a tie up arrangement or something but let me just give a comparable example suppose you are having a firm in uh, your uh, knowing a ca firm or anyone say in metro city i'm just giving a hypothetical example it doesn't mean that opportunity exists only in metro city I, i don't even mean to say that there are constraints in the firms in metro city the constraint which you are facing about manpower it is severe over there as far as cost is concerned comparatively just to give an example suppose you are doing x job in say 5000 rupees the same job might have been done by that firm maybe at uh, 2x or 3x if you start creating manpower which is geographically geographically spread one is that as far as bank audit or any such assignments are concerned it becomes easy to have additional manpower available in, in your hand when you are developing this cat tool kind of capabilities you can become a kind of a processing unit when you develop the expertise and the data crunching can be done by you because it's pure data crunching which one requires like for example if i get a assignment of a bank where they want to check the automation process of iraq now so i will take multiple dumps of various accounts and i need to follow particular process and verify that now for that process i need someone you know who is dedicatedly good in the that technique try to become expertise in that area also because in days to come you need to be able to use the data and usage of data is not only using word and excel there is world which is you know beyond that so start yourself equipped with that so that your time is saved 
you know, when you are doing executing any work. I'm not saying that that is not possible through Excel, but it is much quicker in uh, by using CAD tools. So equip yourself with that. Yeah. Sure, sure. I'll just take five minutes and uh, we'll break. Now, uh, one more suggestion, uh, and then we'll take a break. Uh, I was talking about communication with the previous auditor and obtaining NOC of that. If possible, try to connect with that particular earlier auditor. There are some, you know, at times there might be some insight which he might provide it to you. See, there are certain ticklish areas which he is not able to capture or he is not able to get hold of because there are always certain areas which all of us also know. Think about the earlier bank audit which you have done and you are aware about certain loopholes which you are almost aware about, but you haven't got any, uh, you know, concrete example for that. So you are not able to write it down. Take such clues from earlier auditor. Typically, most of the CAs, at least verbally, they, they are very liberal in uh, you know, expressing their views. If you ask him in writing, he will say that, okay, uh, this is the NOC and that's it. But if you ask him verbally, take, take him into confidence, ask him that any uh, specific major I need to take or any specific type of loan is there uh, prevalent wherein you feel that uh, you, know, you are not uh, that comfortable so that you can concentrate on that area. See, there is a clear-cut communication between bankers which always happens. The moment you go to any branch, that branch manager will always contact your earlier branch manager. He will ask that how this fellow has performed, whether he's interested in going around or roaming around or whether he will sit in the branch where you have taken him to a uh, you know, hotel and how much time you have spent and what are the ways to dodge him, you know, to be very uh, blunt. Same way we can do without breaching any confidentiality. Why I'm saying breaching any confidentiality is that whenever you are, even if you are talking over a phone, Avoid asking something related to a particular account or particular person. You can always say that you tell us the areas where you feel that we should concentrate right from the beginning. And usually CAs are vocal about that. You know, I will give an example. Like suppose the earlier auditor has got insufficient time to maybe say, check subvention of agricultural loan. He can tell you that, that this is agri-based branch. So at the end, I was running short of that time. You start at the beginning itself. These are, you know, basic tips which all of us also... Uh, if asked, we give to the other, uh, you know, other auditor. On our own, we rarely do that. But there is no harm in asking the earlier person. At times, he might give you certain tips about how to handle the branch persons, or who is the person who will uh, uh, be a little ticklish with you or uh, try to dodge you. So you can take that precaution. One more thing is that sometimes, subsequent to the audit, there are certain lacunas which that branch auditor might have realized that these are the areas which, which got skipped from mind. And it's better that if you ask him also, then usually, uh, you know, he will communicate with you that these are the areas wherein I was not able to pay sufficient attention. I had done that work, but I was not satisfied to the extent, uh, you know, coverage which I did. Make use of those tips and then plan for your audit. And your audit program should be day-wise as to what is your milestone, what you have to achieve. Otherwise, everything will get percolated only at the end of the day. Make a habit to sit late at the branch right from the beginning. It's not 10 to 6 work which we are supposed to do when we are doing the statutory branch audit. Because if you do 10 to 6, practically we will end up in not really doing the audit. We are sufficiently paid in the sense as compared to other practice. As compared to fees, uh, better uh, I shouldn't say anything because the 10% increase is after 10 years. <laughs> which used to be a 25% increase every every three years. That was a norm prior to this uh, recent uh, development. So until 2013, for last almost two or three terms, there was a 25% rise which has occurred for every three years actually. So compare that with the current scenario. Leave that aside because still it is remunerative for most of us. But, sorry? It's not bonus actually. That's why I said that it's better that we forget that practice as uh, uh, you know as a kind of a uh, bonus which you are getting. We are into graduate, uh, we are into excretia mode, so it's better that we shouldn't have any uh, uh, bonus privileges. But again, coming back to the point, always make it a point to have communication with the previous auditors. He will give you ample kind of uh, insight of that particular branch, which makes your life easier for the next ten days. Because the moment you step out of the branch your relationship or comfort with that branch is lost. Your earlier auditor must have experienced the same thing. So, you know, his experience should count, you know, as far as your planning goes. So, we'll take a break of uh, five, ten minutes and we'll continue. If anything specific you want me to add, because I'm going a little generic for the simple reason that uh, 
from Maran said it was good that there were no topic allowed. So as I said, so I just want to uh, keep on adding certain points. It's more about to make you think about uh, the way you are conducting the audit. So I just wanted to uh, try in that sense. Yeah. So we'll again assemble after the break. Uh, should we continue? Yeah. A uh, couple of things actually, uh, which I will uh, just touch upon uh, based on suggestions which I have received. So uh, let me just finish off uh, the existing part and I will touch upon that. Uh, uh, two things was one was about uh, request to talk a little bit about uh, SVB uh, Bank, Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, I will just you know express my views about that, but it's uh, still in I think in uh, process of investigation. It's very uh, early to even reach at any conclusion. But whatever is there as per news article, I will just try to throw some light from my as my personal views. Uh, second is about uh, certain empowerment process about uh, private sector banks and other banks related to other than uh, statutory audit area. So I would just like to touch upon that also. And uh, one query was related to uh, gold loan. So uh, uh, the next speaker is already going to uh, take it up. Uh, but with his permission, I will just add a couple of points related to that because I think that's a kind of a uh, bothering thing for uh, all of you in uh, this particular area because there are pockets in India wherein gold loans are prevalent. I am also aware about that. And in every state, there are certain pockets to be very specific. So as far as gold loan is concerned, across the banking sector, the ticklish point is that many a times this gold loan, there are two ticklish points actually, one which was not asked to me, but that, that also I will uh, speak up. Rather that I will speak up first about gold loan, whether the, uh, it should be categorized that agriculture or gold loan or normal gold loan. Uh, when you are uh, talking about normal gold loan and agriculture gold loan, the basic distingu uh, distinguishing factor is that what is the end use of that? It's not that every gold loan which is sanctioned to farmer will be agriculture gold loan. And it is a responsibility of the bank to prove that what is the end use of that loan and it is not your responsibility. So mere declaration by saying that the borrower is farmer and that's why we are saying that as agriculture gold loan, it doesn't make any sense. Second thing is that as far as agriculture loans are concerned, the documents set are typically different from normal commercial loans. So have, have it checked also. Third thing is that as far as interest application is concerned for agriculture loan, the methodology is different. Interest can be compounded only on crop season basis not on the basis of monthly uh, debiting to that account. So the interest might get applied on monthly basis, but compounding is not permitted on monthly basis. So gather all these circumstantial evidences also to distinguish between AGL and GL. You know, that was the first point. Second issue, uh, which I suppose that uh, is a kind of ticklish issue, is about uh, loans which are closed uh, on the same date and opened on the same day. Now, if you come across a scenario where there is a transfer entry, from newly opened uh, loan to the earlier loan, because that is the basic uh, first, uh, you, know, you can say first level of query which will be there. It is an easier query to tackle. It will amount to evergreening of loan because without repayment, if you are closing an earlier loan by way of sanctioning of new loan, it straight away amounts to evergreening and you have to mark that account as NPA. There is no uh, uh, second doubt about that. Now, when you raise this query, uh, that's why I said that it is the first level query. The second level might appear in the next year, wherein cash will be shown as deposited and then withdrawn. Now, what you need to be careful about such instances is that, uh, you know, go through the underlying documents which are available at the branch. So typically, pain slip is there. And to be more critical, CCTV footage is also there as to whether the person has walked into the branch and really gone to the cashier's cabin or not. In the sense, he has deposited cash or not. Make use of these instances. Because the reason is that if someone is uh, you know, portraying something which has not really happened, it amounts to fraud. Make branch aware about that. That if you really want to say that cash is deposited in that particular account, we are going to verify that. So think twice before representing that, uh, you know, before us. If for by whatever means, if they are able to, uh, you know, justify that the cash is deposited, new loan is sanctioned, there is nothing to stop about that. Let him do that and we will do our job. But if it is a first level query wherein transfer entries are there, it straight away amounts to uh, ever ending of account and it can go backwards also. Like for example, if you have a loan account, wherein say last five years, this is the practice. You know, every year there is a new loan sanction 
old loan gets closed or maybe partial portion is by way of cash deposit maybe interest component or maybe certain portion out of that and new loan gets sanctioned go backwards and you can have that date of entry also my month uh, backward so like suppose it is five years backwards we are in march 23 it means that it has it is prevailing since say march 18 you can have june 18 taken as date of entry straight away you can classify that under da2 category also da2 or da3 whatever, whatever is the category no one is going to stop you about that now how to prove that also one is ever ready second one is that typically gold packets are sealed and usually in most of the banks there is a note which is written on that uh, packet as to the date of sealing of that uh, packet. That's what usually happens. Just have a look at that. Try to gather as much as circumstantial evidences as possible to prove that in reality the gold packet was never opened. It was never revalued because you need to open that packet. Let's presume that it's a genuine case. Someone has come and deposited back that cash and now he wants to avail that loan. So what should be there on the record? One is deposit and other things should be available. Second is gold packet should have been returned to that particular customer. So in the gold packet register, that entry has to be firstly, it has to be handed over, then again taken, then value should be called. Movement has to be there. So there are any number of things, you know, which are there. If any of the things is missing, you can always point out in your board. Now let's presume that the branch is portraying you before you that this is a prevalent banking practice and everyone is doing that. Ask them to give that in writing. Whatever they are, that's why, you know, I initially said that suppose I'm making a statement from this place, I should be having enough courage to write it down and sign it off. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. If I, you know, if I'm saying here that you should do audit for five days, and if I say that, no, but I won't give it in writing, whatever I'm saying is of no use, actually. You know, I should be able to stand by my, uh, you know, words. Let the mind do that. The moment if they really do that, it becomes a ready-made material for you to put in main audit report and in LFR that this is the practice this bank is following, which might processing charges, valuation charges, that value should be there at the branch on that date. <laughs> See, there are n number of things, you know, to prove otherwise that the practice hasn't prevailed. See, if the bank wants to still continue with the practice, let them ask the borrower to come and deposit the cash in the account. Let them sanction new loan. See, we are not here to stop any banking business, but we are definitely here to, uh, you know, find out the lacunas in that. If any ever winning has happened, it's better to point it out. And as far as uh, uh, the adversities of this qualification and these things go, that can anyway happen. See, none of us is certain that whether we will get bank audit or not. So why to really worry about, you know, where they are going to give us branch out? Leave that aside. We will do our job. And it's better that all of us do that job together rather than, uh, you know, someone getting singled out or few auditors agreeing to this kind of a practice. Sir, RBI is Yeah. See, first thing is that as far as gold loans are concerned, there is no exemption like NAC and IBT. That is first thing. Second thing is that by that logic, all loans are secure. Why only gold? Like say property loan. Banks are keeping 50% margin in, you know, in uh, advanced against property or ODS property. There is no question of security. In fact, IRACMO preamble makes it clear that it is not dependent upon security. It is dependent upon conduct of that account, recovery part of that, income generation part of that. Otherwise, it will only, you know, start ballooning up. I have taken a say a loan of say 50,000. Next year I take loan of 55,000. Next year I take 60,000 because there is a natural growth in gold prices itself. Now that is something which is not expected to be the case. If that is the case, which the bank wants to give as a kind of a leverage to that particular borrower, let them sanction OD facility. No one has stopped them to do that. I am not saying that bank should do business. But if they are sanctioning term loan, the term loan has to be repaid and then only new loan has to be taken. If it is a bullet payment loan also, repayment has to happen. Let me give you a couple of you know fraudulent cases which has happened on a broader scale. See, there are instances in banking. I won't name it, name any bank or company per se, wherein bullet pay, uh, you know repayment uh, based term loans are sanctioned to big corporates. I am sure that all of you are aware about that. So the uh, you know typically the loans are given in such a fashion that they are sanctioned for a period of say six months, one year, two year, whatever is the tenure by doing proper credit appraisal. So what is expected by bullet loan is that at the end of the tenure, ideally entire amount should be paid at one stroke. But there are extensions which are given. Now, whenever the extensions are given, 
we need to ask ourselves as to what is the reason for that extension does it amount to restructuring now whether i have a new loan created and that earlier loan is closed or if i simply extend that both amount to the same thing so it's not question of only gold loan it's question of any other credit facility there has to be a reason why you are extending that see by opening a new account it doesn't change the nature of that uh, particular facility it's kind of extension you are given an extension for repayment which amounts to restructuring so either invoke that you know particular criteria or say that it is ever winning ever winning is a better word actually but that's what is expected now i will tell you the flip side if you don't do what will happen let's presume that there is a gold loan fraud which occurs and you are an investigator you are a forensic auditor what you raise and question on auditor as well as the bankers wherein you for wherein you are experiencing or wherein you now you are understanding that all loans are just you know rolled over like that so as a forensic auditor the stand which you will take you are supposed to take that stand before any product occurs so that is a simple question because see wherever you are as see wherever you are going as a forensic auditor you are taking a different stand wherever you go as a statutory you will take a different stand wherever you go as a counter auditor you will take another third stand that shouldn't happen our professional judgment has to be same see if on top of that if gold underlying gold itself is uh, you know not having that purity and other thing that is beyond our capacity to verify we are not there to verify purity of gold we are not there to count gold or not or not we can only count packets and we can only see that whether they are sealed or not whether the valuation certificate is there or not based on impalement of that particular value that's it beyond that we don't have scope but for ever winning we definitely have a scope wherein we are supposed to point it out just to share with you rbi many times uh, uh, or not even many times once in a year actually rbi communicates with ca institute about the divergences which they have found out so typically one of the common area is about ever winning they don't pinpoint any particular type of loan but they categorically many a times state that wherever there is a ever winning auditors are supposed to uh, you know say that in their report or qualify the report so rbi is very clear on that if that is not the case they can give exemption in iraq norms but exemption is not there so we need to stick to our uh, stand you know coming to the uh, part of actual carrying out of work uh, see typically all of us uh, have traditionally uh, groomed up with the concept of uh, permanent file and audit working file even though standards on auditing are gradually changing but we have a kind of mindset uh, that something is permanent and something is regular for that audit now what which kind of basic documents which you should be aware about before starting of audit is you need to have your checklist which are prepared for every product of loan you need to have a short note for your working paper file which can give you a kind of a pointer as to what was the type of product you know which is denoted by a particular uh, uh, borrower uh, or you know borrowings or i should say lending uh, to be specific same way for deposit side also you need to have a note to define that which kind of product it is banks are having innovative products like say flexi rds are there normal recurring deposits are there another thing is that for every line item in your gl make it a point to note that what you have checked about that line item so it can be maybe a scrutiny of jotting which is made available to you it can be a random sampling for example interest paid account so the basis for verification is that you might have picked up one account for one month for across the product and you have verified that product product for interest paid as well as interest received so that is more than sufficient but document that what you have verified second point is that as far as lfir is concerned the revised format of lfir which came out in september 20 that ask you to specify the loan accounts which are verified by you so in a way it's good that you are accountable only to the extent of loans which are verified by you so be very clear about listing out those accounts which are verified by you don't go beyond that don't showcase that uh, you know you have done a very good job it's not required whatever you have done you say that that's that's what i have done yeah yeah with respect to listing out the account yeah let us say for interest verification yeah. i have chosen an account yeah those ten accounts i only verify interest yeah for ten accounts uh, new accounts i i verify the documentation mm -hmm. uh, for them i also verify the interest also yeah no uh, should we does it mean that if they mention an account there 
360 degrees of the deck no, of this. No, not at all. Actually, what LFR expects is the questions which are related to advances. They are mainly about monitoring, appraisal and other things. And there is a mandatory criteria as to which account should be mandatorily picked up based on the criteria which are specified. So you have to confine only to those questions only related to that account. Rest all things like say interest paid, interest received. You don't have to mention that in LFR. It's not required. It is not mandated. So those which are all, all the issues in that no, what you need to verify is first thing is that the documentation process and appraisal process wherein the there are specific questions are there. So that is your basic coverage. In addition to that, it is better that you verify the master data which is fed in the system so that you know you are sure about that basics of that. But you are not supposed to verify 100% interest calculation. That is not warranted. For convenience purpose, you can pick up one month you know out of the same sample so that you have 360 degrees analysis of those accounts. But it is not mandated. In LFR, it's not mandated to do that. Yes, I want to come in. Yeah. Uh, whether I have to come in properly or not. What are the list of accounts you have verified? Right. Like I am mentioning one, two, three, four, five, Correct. six. Correct. Right? So, from those accounts which are listed in that column, yeah. what is the scope, sir? That advances section of LFR is the scope. That's it. No, sir. We are mentioning account number. No, no, correct. Account but number, no? No, no, that is correct. But uh, that para or you know that line is related to advances section of LFR. Yes, so no, advances no, section no, of LFR, no, you need to cover. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. So those related to loans and advances section only. That's it. So when you are going beyond that, like suppose you are verifying interest calculation of some other account, that account need not be included here. So only for those questions in that exactly. section, all those questions Correct. we have to verify. Exactly, exactly. Precisely, precisely. I will tell you the background of that. Uh, see the background of uh, this, uh, you know, line item getting included about which accounts you verified. See earlier, what used to happen was that from auditor side also, we never used to say that what we did as audit. See, look at from the you know uh, audit or regulator's point of view. Now we are taking the owners that these are the 10 accounts which are verified. Sample, I have to decide. So there is criteria of sample. One is mandatory sample, which is a predefined criteria. As a firm, I might have internal uh, you know, criteria. Just to give an example, what I will prefer is I will always pick up at least one account of each team. So that you know, I, I know that you know which kind of products are there at the branch. So I will include that. So one is mandatory, one is at my discretion. And my discretion means I can have 10 accounts, I can have two accounts also, depending upon type of bank or type of branch, I should say. So that is my uh, criteria. But once I chose that sample, the response to those accounts is confined only to loans and advances section of the LFR, not beyond that. So there are specific questions which are there, like appraisal, monitoring, that any other, like they have a specific question. You have to answer related to that only for those set of accounts. So if you are picking up any sample only for interest calculation, that is not required to be there in LFR. It is part of your internal documentation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So quick mortality, you don't have to select. It is based on the report which is available to you. So it is not part of sample. Insurance cover also it is based on the report. And you have to specify that is insurance, you know, that report which you are using for expired insurance, you need to mention that you have used CBS generated report. And as a matter of precaution, what you need to do is pick up three, four, uh, you know, line items that verify the actual insurance policy, satisfy yourself that that is correctly appearing or not. But then you can always say that it is based on CBS generated report and you have to test check that. That's it. So, uh, see, I will give you another example. Let's say early warning signal, you know, that para is there. Now, early warning signal, what is meant by that? You need to verify that whether the early warning system is working in that uh, branch or not, or to set of accounts, not only your accounts. It's more about process. It's not about early warning signal related to that account. So like uh, early mortality case, it is not related to only those accounts. It's based on, uh, you know, the uh, details which are available to you. If any early mortality case is there, you have to report that. It may or may not be, a, a, you know, of your sample size. Like suppose there are say 10 personal loans are there, which are early mortality, for whatever reasons, you have to just list it down. The accounts which you will pick it up, you have to be thoroughly checking that right from appraisal, monitoring, asset classification. So all those questions should be answered against that. 
so that is the importance of that uh, accounts which are mentioned don't include accounts where only interest checking is done by you that is not expected there it's your internal documentation which you need to see so the best practice is that against all your lfar line items it's better that you maintain your audit working file based on that only like say cash so your first section will be cash verification certificate uh maybe if you have verified atm then that jp roll print out will be there whatever it is there so arrange your file in such a fashion that even you are certain that each and every clause is uh, verified by you and you are having sufficient documentation to support that so don't drift away from the documentation part because many a times we miss it out uh, you know at the time of closure of audit the documentation is missed out so for everything just serially number it or tick it all at least that you have maintained that or maybe keep a flag for each and every section of lfr so that it becomes easy for you to retrieve that also and as much as possible prepare standard formats for verification like say even cash verification you can have your own format which is different for your firm simple format i'm not getting into any complexities of that so ensure that your firm's uh, internal guidelines are also followed by yeah one question yeah. we have the intra bank reconciliation yeah अंडर एस एस सिक्स हंड्रेड uh when you get a closing a closing circular actually closing circular circular one is the one which bank issues second one is the one which central auditor asks you to perform certain uh, job at the branch level in certain banks actually they are issuing a categoric uh, you know uh, you can say advisory wherein they say that inter branch reconciliation is not required to be verified by you if that is the case you have to just mention that if not if that condition is not there then it's a kind of a disclaimer which you have to give that the details are not made available to you or you can say that based on jotting you are saying that uh, old entries are not there and what you need to take uh, you know do it as a precaution is just run through that ledger account to see that you know suddenly there is no uh, office account which is used to park any advance which is given to staff or it is not used for any uh, accommodation for any borrower which account we have to check sir all office accounts there are num- n number of names suspense account enterprise account system suspense account every bank has innovative uh, you know names of ledger which are given any account which is not related to any categoric uh, activity uh, it's more of parking account section so day by day these parking accounts usage is getting restricted because through cbs you can control that but still you need to satisfy yourself so take a dump sort that maybe based on uh, certain criteria search that at least go through that satisfy yourself that this is not used as a kind of a parking account because that is a real uh, worrisome factor that during the year it will be used as a parking account at the end of the year it's nullified but in certain cbs systems now the bank have become prudent they are locking that uh, account also but ultimately locking and unlocking is discretion of the banks so uh, we should not be uh, presuming that it has happened then as far as this audit working file uh, further part is concerned when you are having a audit program in your file if you are not preparing that start preparing that audit program which will cover all the areas all the sections the simplest way to do that is you can have the same kind of question here which you are picking up maybe in lfr you have those sections of lfr which are mentioned in audit uh, you know audit program define or rather write it down who has verified that what is the date of verification of that so you have ready made documentation available with you to prove that you have carried out work at audit you are aware that you are carried out the work but your file should speak about that that how the work was carried out as all of us typically take attendance certificate at the branch now if someone questions you as to why you have spent 15 days your audit program will support that that why so many days were required and who did that job in rare cases banks do raise question but in genuine cases i have never seen any bank raising the question of mandates which are spent by the auditor because we can always say that it's our discretion to define that how many persons are there you need to only prove that you are not using that uh, facility in a uh, for a different purpose so make it a point that whatever work is done by every team member of your firm gets recorded in that audit program so you need to prove that you know this person has done so and so job partner has done so and so job maybe review job or whatever it is 
So your file should speak about that. Then as I said that as far as discussions with the branch officials are concerned, it might become a kind of a daily affair for you if you're for, if you're finding multiple queries. But whenever you're getting into discussion and if you're certain about your queries prior to discussion, make it a point to send those queries in writing. So when you are discussing, email is, is, is in front of yourself also and himself also. Uh, typically, branch officials might shy away from re responding in writing. So what you do is just ensure that you start jotting down whatever he's saying in front of you. The moment you do that, it will serve multiple purposes. It will make him aware that you are noting down whatever he's saying. So just to give an example, like the same example, like gold loan. If he says that this is a practice which is prevalent across our bank and adjoining bank, so you just you know ask him to hold and say that I'm putting it in uh, my note. The moment you do that, all the nonsense kind of replies will stop. You know they will become kind of aware that you know you are noting whatever they are saying. And once you do that once or twice, just make it a habit to send those minutes immediately. So you conclude the meeting in his cabin before going on. You send an email by saying that see this is what we have discussed. So I've just kept it for my record purpose and we are subjected to peer review. So we require that uh, minutes to be maintained. See, the best uh, option available with us is that we can always say that institute has told us to do that. No one is going to ask institute that whether they are uh, telling that or not, but it is part of peer review is also the reality. So make that habit. Things will be smoother if you start recording minutes. Recording in the sense, not recording per se. I'm saying uh, putting it in writing. And let me share my uh, experience about these minutes and other things. In a couple of instances, even uh, we were under pressure to conclude the audit on a particular date and uh, you know, typically first branch manager will say, then AGM, DGM, GM, regional, all these things will start. The moment if you tell them that I have raised this query four days back with your branch manager, and you can tell them that he was supposed to, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, take it up with you if he's not able to resolve that query, usually no one will pressurize you from any angle. Because once you prove that there was a sufficient opportunity which you had given to, uh, to be heard for that particular branch manager, the responsibility is theirs actually, not ours. So make it a habit to put everything in writing. It's not going to harm you. Even if you want to take any adverse stand or extreme stand also, this is something which will come in support of you. No one will be able to really question you for anything and everything, whether it's a central auditor or whether he's a uh, you know, regional manager. Second thing is that if by any chance, if uh, you know anyone is projecting that the central auditor is advising you something or something of that sort, ask them to give it in writing. That is the best way to tackle that. Because first thing is that you don't know with whom you are speaking. No, you might be speaking with someone uh, you know who may not be even central auditor. If your central auditor gives you in writing to skip a particular account, it's fine. But I've never seen and I've never experienced such kind of a scenario. Who will take that responsibility? Imagine that you are in his place. You will say that do whatever you want to do at branch. I will just go by all your opinion. Because ultimately, if he wants to bypass your opinion, there is a reason which is required. And I have never seen any central auditor dropping any query or dropping any MOC. It never happens. If it happens, actually, uh, when you know uh, uh, I was doing work as a central auditor, what we used to do, if there is some additional evidence you know, which bank produces before us, we used to contact back to the branch auditor. We used to tell him that, see, this is the additional data which is available now with us. If you are satisfied, you can take back the query in writing by saying that now the evidence is made available. So it's not something that one should do backdated. If he's not satisfied, we used to continue with the query. So the onus was with the branch auditor only. Only it was a kind of a support level that at times at branch level, there might be some questions which might get dodged, which for central auditor level, there might be evidences which can be made available. Like say valuation report is not there. Just to give an example, maybe later on valuation report is made available. If the branch auditor is really satisfied with the valuation report, then one can accept because it's a sub subsequent event related to the earlier period. So it's not about regulation of accounts sub in subsequent period. It's more of confirming the value as on that date. So in such cases, it's always gets back to the branch auditor. No one takes any decision at the central office level from auditor's angle, barring those top 20 branches. So be assured about that. Don't ever think that your query gets stopped. There is nothing of that sort. As far as maternity is concerned, all the banks typically provide the maternity scale, like say 5,000, 10,000, 25,000, whatever it is. What it really means is, if you find a query below that, you need not pass MOC. 
and you can have that query rectified as on today like say processing charges have not received so you can ask the branch that you recover as on today i will not you know pass an emoc but you mention that in lfa by saying that this is what you have found out and it is recovered on so and so date and emoc is not suggested because it was below that uh, you know uh, maternity level there are two reasons for that the moment you write that in lfa bank might understand that there might be a ticklish issue at a particular branch otherwise they are not even aware about uh, the queries which you are raising second thing is that you are not bypassing anything so the revenue leakage is stalled at that particular point itself third one is that let's presume that at every branch in a particular region such queries are raised central auditor becomes aware that there is some system flaw which is happening in a particular region it's not question of passing any moc there is no award for moc at such so don't uh, get into habit that some of you have to pass emoc that is not required what is required is if you find a process flaw that is more important it will you know give a kind of a value addition to that bank also now another thing is that as far as this report closure is concerned yeah we are having whatsapp group that will post there and similarly everybody will check the same i will tell you the flaw in that good that you have take out the take out the point since pandemic in uh, for march 20 closure uh i have seen couple of whatsapp group where in standardized uh, disclaimers were given and people used that uh, you know irrespective of what was the reality like you know someone must have prepared a disclaimer because files were not made available to you maybe that area was sealed or something you cannot use that disclosure where the files are available to you and you haven't verified certain files so don't let that happen see whatsapp group are having uh, limited uh, usage this type of emoji Which one? Like MOC. Yeah. Where it is not required, it's a process. Uh, uh, yeah. So in that case, we can suggest the other branch people. No, you can suggest. Only I'm talking about uh, the person who is reading that. He should first see that that is applicable to me or not. Because nowadays everyone is, uh, you know, PhD holder of WhatsApp University. So everyone expresses, uh, you know, his knowledge. Like say, whenever the budget gets over. before that budget gets over people start you know uh, messaging that how the budget is good or bad before even reading the budget because finance minister never reads the budget actually it's only highlight and budget comes after that i don't know even in 5 minutes how can how someone can really go through that and react on that but that's what people do but if you look at any expert he will never react instantly usually it's always one or two days gap if you uh, look at the uh, you know the typical experts who are there they will never give any, give any instant reaction and that is not expected also but our media will express no one can that's why i said that whatsapp university is open university so uh, you don't have to be expert in that subject like svb bank there are n number of theories which are floated silicon valley bank how many of them are really aware about what is debited what is credit in banking industry no one is even aware about that forget about treasury board but still everyone will try to express some opinion someone will say that it would uh, you know affect uh, indian banking industry someone is saying that now everything is going to collapse see you can't stop anyone so wherever you are reading any uh, message on whatsapp uh, which sometimes i do on certain whatsapp group i just ask him that what is the source of this information and then usually you know that query stops the moment you ask him to quote any circular number or para number that is the best way to tackle that if the person is really knowledgeable and doing something he should post that you cannot have own opinion posted on whatsapp whatsapp group that is something uh, uh, which might go uh, haywire because the person who is reading may not be even aware about the circumstances under which this query is raised so like you know give me example of process fee someone will say that okay the, uh, you know there are so many people who have found out this query so i should also find it out and you will waste entire day in finding that query when the query doesn't exist so that shouldn't happen it now as far as this uh, audit uh, working paper file is concerned uh i'm sure that all of you are aware about the standards on auditing about working paper file how many years the working paper file should be maintained yeah and how many years you are having your own working paper files maintained in your office all seven years are available they are serially numbered all papers are serially numbered they are closed properly okay i will give one example See in the banks, you have seen voucher bundles, right? It's a common practice. Suppose you find out a bank wherein voucher bundles are not stitched, only five, no serial number. 
what will be your conclusion apply the same conclusion to your own working paper file that suppose your working paper file is i mean say 100 pages ask yourself whether you can find out any working paper which gets missed out at a later stage maybe due to mishandling or purpose or intention might be anything so when you are closing that working paper file even though there is a sufficient time available to close that working paper file as per the standard itself it means that it's only rearranging the file that's why the period is given it is not for asking for additional document after that so once you sign out the report at the branch no email communication no verbal communication should be there from your end to the branch asking for certain additional report because you are running short of certain papers in your working paper file always keep this thing in your mind if something goes wrong this will go against you that you have signed up the report and later on you have asked certain report don't let that happen secondly as far as the serial numbering is concerned once you close the audit ask someone sitting in your office to rearrange the file just write down the number maybe at the bottom of the page or maybe have that serial number stamp which is there which can be used and close the file once for all but make it as a habit it will take uh, you know initially it will be a pain to close such files and it requires courage to close such files in real fashion but ultimately if you are going to anyway close the file there is no harm in serially numbering the file only thing is that make it a habit to have a index for that so you should be aware about how the papers are arranged and that's more than sufficient and this work can be definitely given to any assistant you don't have to really get involved you can only oversee that that whether everything is there or not and then keep that for 7 years and again that is at least for 7 years it's not maximum 7 years so if you are destroying any file make it a point that you are recording that in your record so you need to have a forms policy that maybe after 10 years or maybe after 8 years you are destroying make it a paper kind of a noting that so and so files were destroyed and so and so dates maybe you can give it to the recycler that is a easier way you get a certificate also there are ib approved recyclers are there which are there across india that is the best thing to do actually so they give you a certificate that so many uh, kgs of paper was collected and recycled and you can keep it on paper, record means this is the conclusive part of the radius uh, we are in the correct year only now whenever you are uh, uh, compiling working paper file there might be multiple draft reports which you have drafted now whenever any draft report is undergoing a change that every version needs to record that why you are changing a particular statement so suppose earlier there is an adverse comment which you have drafted and later on you are you know removing that uh, you know comment and that paper is in your file so there has to be a reason recorded over there as to why you are removing that uh, particular discrepancy and why you are accepting bank stamp so make it a point that every paper which is there in your file if it is in query form every query should be resolved either resolved or reported if any query is resolved if your report is draft draft report is getting upgraded ensure that that is getting recorded if you don't have such reasons better not to keep that paper in your file you see at times it happens that you have loosely uh, you know worded something you know that this is not the proper way to do that you don't have any justification to do that no one has stopped you to remove that because till the time report is not final everything is draft so till that time you can do everything only thing is that if you have already handed over that paper to anyone like say email it sent it's better that even if your mistake is there admit that mistake and say that it was inadvertently sent and this is the correct para this is the correct query don't shy away from that because all these are getting trailed every email which you have sent to anyone whether it is internal in your office or to external agency it gets recorded so even if you have sent a wrong email also better to send another email by saying that ignore earlier email so it's a kind of a white wash which you are admitting and going ahead you haven't issued the report so till that time everything is pardonable once you issue the report it becomes a difficulty there are ways and means to even withdraw the report we won't get into that because there are reasons which are required for that now once you close the report at the time of closure itself ensure that you are getting mri don't depend upon the assurance which is given by the branch manager that we will send it tomorrow we will send it day after tomorrow so if he says that you say that we will sign the report also day after tomorrow so before you take udi and take mri copy from the branch manager if he denies you for that you can simply say that i am not going to sign the report if they say that it is centrally issued tell them that i want a letter uh, you know to that effect from central auditor no central auditor gives such kind of a report or letter they are bothered about their top 20 branches they are also branch auditor so mrl will get issued worst case scenario if if there is a uh, you know a wastage of time which is happening about this mrl and other things 
just convert that MRR into a negative assurance. So send a letter to the branch, address to the branch, write down all the things which you observed. And at the end, just take his signature by saying that he has gone through the entire letter and he's agreeing with whatever is written in that particular letter. So it's a kind of a negative confirmation which you can opt in. Opt either of that. But don't ever close your audit report unless you get a management representation letter. That is a kind of must which you should not you know, get away with. And many times the branches will first tell you that you are the only auditor who is taking uh, MR. That is never a reality. See, it's something like that, you know, every time you enter into a branch, the branch manager would say that I have never seen, you know, so much, so sincere auditor like you. Yeah, and we, many times we know that who was the last person, sometimes we know that person too well also, but this is what is going to be said about you in the next year. So, so always, you know, desist from uh, all these practices, whatever is required, we have every right to get that. Like say engagement letter, better to issue that take acknowledgement. See, engagement letter is useful that we, it's a kind of a scope limitation as to what we are going to deliver is what we are defining over there. Because otherwise it's open, you know, open for everything. Restrict your liability as an auditor. Same way when you are taking MR, whatever he is representing, right from whatever nonsense representation has, might have been given, like say this is the practice, this is the banking practice, take that in writing. If it's ready to sign, it's perfectly fine. You know, based on MR, you can uh, you know use it in LFR. Another is that wherever you are having negative points, which you want to point out in your main report or LFR, try to include that in the MR itself. So what will happen is whatever is the banking practice, the say of the banker will get recorded. So you're telling that, see, whatever you are saying, you record that, we will make a note of that in our report also. It's not one-sided report which you are going to issue. Typically in LFR, we have ample space also to issue the report. We can say that this is the stand of the bank and we can then give a reason as to why we are not agreeing with that. So their opinion or their views are also expressed. Our views are also expressed. At the time of consolidation of LFR, these things are automatically taken care of. So MR is something which, which is a must. Yeah. MR is uh, uh, part of our working purpose. Yeah, it is part of our working purpose. It's not to be submitted. Not to be submitted anymore. Some banks of late, they have started a practice wherein MRL is also part of web-based return. So they give you in standardized format and they have additional space wherein you can add up. So they, they naturally branch manager should have a one copy, whichever is signing, but it is part of our working paper file. It is not for any other authority. It's for us actually. Sir, yeah. Yeah. Large advances, yeah. All the details of that account that used to be given to the auditors. Yeah. So, uh, will that, uh, uh, should we also take that uh, large advances in respect of this uh, 10 crores or 10 percentage? Yeah. See, yeah. in excess of that, for each account, we have to take that. Yeah. No. Uh, no, no, no. Actually, there the criteria is uh, defined. Earlier it was two crores and above. I think now it is five crores and above. I'm not able to just recall that. Uh, so, that annexure actually, which bank gives you, that's annexure to LFR, which is not supposed to be signed by us. Yes. The information it is only information which they have to provide. That's it. So, you have to just append that, but you should not be signing that. Those mandatory criteria, same, same criteria, yeah, yeah, beginning, yeah. Of, the beginning of the year. And that is more of informative in purpose. Yes. Even if bank asks you to sign, you are not supposed to sign that. Yeah. No, some banks do ask. Some banks ask you to sign on many things actually. <laughs> see, what we need to see is, we need to see our appointment letter. Whatever is written in the appointment letter, you need to sign only on those pages. You should not go beyond that. Exactly. So the list is there, list of certificates, list of reports, typically audit report, LFR, and list of certificates and MOC, natural, means the, which is the case. Now, while conducting the audit, couple of tips actually in addition to what we discussed. First thing is that always try to make an analysis of the GL over the period. So just to give an example, suppose you get a GL dump of say 12 months, you know, every month end, or maybe every 15th of every month, so that you know, you know the real figures rather than month end figures. So just try to pull those figures in Excel format. Try to analyze as to whether there is any abnormalities there related to any particular GL head or any particular line item. So if you find out that there is a sudden jump in any particular criteria, it might be borrowing, or sorry, it might be any type of borrow account or it might be any type of deposit account. So any abnormality which is seen by you through this you know, exercise, 
make use of that while you know uh, doing a kind of a concentration about the area which you wish to take for example if you suddenly see that there is a sudden growth in personal loan in a particular branch as compared to earlier uh, uh, you know figures you need to understand that what is the uh, reason for the sudden rise whether there is any group loan which is sanctioned or whether there is any special drive which the bank has carried out so these are the uh, reasons these are normal circumstances but if you see that there are multiple loans which gets transferred along with the branch manager who is transferred in that particular branch there is something suspicious about that so try to analyze about the type of loans which are getting opened whether any sudden jump or decrease is there in any particular product line whether it is deposit or uh, you know uh, lending uh, that is advances it doesn't matter but make use of those uh, uh, you know uh, variances which are there then as far as uh, exceptional reports are concerned in most of the bank they have practice wherein there is a centralized uh, server or disk is there where the reports are dumped many times even the bankers don't refer to that so first try to understand from the branch manager that which are the reports which are regularly received to him whether he goes through that or not that is not our priority or we don't have to even comment on that once he tells you that these are the reports which are daily weekly monthly or fortnightly depending on the frequency make use of those reports while you are conducting the audit many a times half of your job will be done by by way of just going through those reports you know those are readily available uh, you know with you if the branch manager is good branch manager who is a kind of efficient branch manager he might be already using those reports so he will be more than happy to tell you and he might be very vocal that how how he is using those reports some branch managers will simply say that yeah some reports are received uh, you can refer that then you have, you have to understand that whether he is making use of that or not then you need to be little more uh, you know uh, conscious while uh, using those reports but reports are something which are now available in most of the cbs system if some report is there which is vital for your reporting purpose you can very well ask for that specific report a customized report from their data center almost all banks now have a practice wherein you can escalate a query with reason actually as to why you want a particular report if it is related to your lfir or normal reporting they will escalate to their data center and the reports are typically made in one or two days uh, you know of time you can get printed you can get in soft copy also both are available see if the bank tells you that they are not going to share that you can ask them to give you a separate pc wherein you can do the analysis so they have to you know provide your pc with excel that is a so if they don't have you can say that i want to use that report because see nowadays uh, usage of report is something which is now digested fact by most of the branches so they will give you those reports problem with banks are that if you ask uh, certain kind of dumb data dumb they are still resisting like suppose you ask all the bank statements they will not give you that because they feel that you might misuse that or if you ask dump of the entire master data they will not be ready to share you uh, you know that see you need to justify as to what is the usage of that data you are going to do if you are able to justify banks are not resisting exceptional reports 99.99% bank will never resist because it is for usage of audit and uh, monitoring purpose worst case scenario you ask them to provide a pc do a excel uh, working in that and then ask them to email you that excel uh, spreadsheet because that is your working paper so the original report can be with them your report can be based on that and then you can mention that this is a this is a uh, you know source of this uh, working so that is more than sufficient because many times you will filter certain reports so in that case that is your working paper file in virtual mode then at the time of closure uh, go through faqs of udi wherein it is amply clear as to how to generate udi it is only single udi which is supposed to be generated but at times it might happen that you are issuing a particular certificate at a later date so at that point of time you need to generate additional udi and sometimes it's a ticklish uh, scenario so let me just pinpoint that also at the last day you might be working uh, you know till midnight you generate the udi and of a prior date and you digitally sign on the next day don't let that happen you wait for that half an hour you know to pass that date because otherwise it looks odd that you have generated udi suppose today technically at say 11 o'clock at night and the actual certification that is a digital signing you are putting after that date uh, which is not technically correct because you cannot have such scenario of magnetic udi which is signed by you so don't let that happen especially about digital uh, signatures wherever you are affixing because in most of the banks now digital signature is already affixed sometimes uh, 
Ya. 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 No, no. You don't have to do that digital signature. You can freeze the report in the system. Signatures are at the end. You can go on closing the uh, returns or certificates. The digital. Then it will be in manual mode. SBI is having digital certificate, digital signature. Yeah. So wherever you are having digital signature, make it a point that you are generating one UDN and signing on the same day. If it is manual, it's a different thing. But again, you know, if you are uh, signing off on multiple dates, you need to have multiple UDNs. So just keep that thing in mind from compliance uh, point of view. Then, as far as certification is concerned. Uh, C Institute had issued a guidance note in 2016 about special purpose certificates and reports. It's available on website. You can download that. Now, why that is required is if you are issuing any certificate, the certificate is supposed to be in that format. The certificates which all of us are issued in banking as a statutory auditor, they are not in that format. So make it a point that you are preparing as a kind of a covering letter. So suppose 20 certificates are issued by you. You can have a single uh, a kind of a covering certificate or report which lists down all those details. So just to give an example, in uh, you know in multiple certificates you have certain comments which you want to attach, maybe scope limitation, or maybe the process which you have carried out you know for a particular certificate. There is no space which is provided for every certification. So this covering report which you will issue that will contain the process which you have followed because that's how the illustrative format is. And you can mention that see, these are the 20 certificates, maybe in a tabular format. And against each certificate, you can write a comment. So just make use of this guidance note. And always remember that guidance note, even if it is not mandatory in technical terms, if you are not using guidance note, you have to record those reasons as to why you are not using guidance note. So like standards are mandatory. You don't have a choice. Guidance note is optional in the sense if you don't want to adopt, you have to write that. Easier way is to adopt the guidance note. I will give you a you know, couple of examples of that. For example, in guidance note of bank audit, if certain process is defined or if certain comment is there, and if you are bypassing that, you need to have a reason for that as to why you have not followed the guidance note. And nowadays, guidance note is considered as evidence in the court of law also. So don't take guidance notes lightly. They are very much mandatory in real sense or practical sense, I should say. Now, let me talk a little about standards. See, there are two type, two standards which all of us are supposed to be aware about. Why I'm saying supposed to be is that one is accounting standard, which is easy to say that we are aware about that. But let me ask you one question. How many of you have tested the correctness of accounting practices which the banks are having as comparison with accounting standard? We presume that they are correct. Right? It's a presumption. I'm not saying that you have to test each and every item. At least read the title of accounting standard and see that you haven't seen any divergences from that. That's a minimum checkpoint. It won't take even half an hour. Because as a partner, you're aware about the banking practice. Just recheck that once, right from depreciation account. Means this is one hit I just wanted to give you. It may or may not gel with what accounting standard is saying. I'm saying may or may not. It doesn't mean that you should raise query at every branch. I didn't mean to say that. Ask yourself that whether it is compliant or not. Second set of standards, which is a little difficult uh, you know, for anyone to uh, uh, you know, give a reply in affirmative way, standards on auditing. As far as standards on auditing is concerned, all standards are mandatory in nature. We don't have a choice. How many of us really have working paper based on standards on auditing? Just ask this question yourself. I will you know, just name a couple of uh, standards on auditing. Let's talk about sampling. We do take samples but we don't record the basis of taking those samples. That's what is required by standard. All of us are following standards or auditing in practice, but we don't document that. The easiest way to do that is take the index of standards or auditing so that, you know, number of standard or auditing and against that, the nomenclature is written. Against that, just put a short note as to how you have complied that. That is more than sufficient compliance with that. But let me tell you one ticklish thing. Why I'm saying ticklish is that, uh, that is a, uh, kind of moderation for all the firms, typically MSME firm, including my firm. I'm also not denying that uh, it's not really fulfilled to that extent. How many of us have read SQC1? Can you raise your hand? And how many of you have been able to adopt that in total sense? 
that is the uh, you can say higher version of that so i will give one simple thing uh, uh, for you to immediately admit that we are not doing uh, what is expected we don't have our hr manual we don't have non disclosure agreements taken from our staff right we don't have that process also defined think about that i am not saying that overnight you have to change but think about this uh, this like to ask just to give an example suppose you are doing audit of sbi how many of us take it in writing that none of the close relatives of our staff is working with sbi that is something which is supposed to be done see it's a self disciplinary action actually it's not that someone is going to tell us and nowadays even the code of uh, you know ethics which are there they are self disciplinary you need to prove yourself that you are independent take a case that if you are you are having an article whose parents are working with sbi and you depute that person at sbi think about what can go wrong why am you know just pointing it out is in years to come start adopting these practices i am not saying that it will be immediately done or overnight will be done but at least make it a point that you are having you are at least aware about the standard of auditing reach to that stage then the next part is not that difficult only thing is that we need to take out our time so we need to invest our time to define that how we are going to adopt that as far as bank audit is concerned many standards on auditing are very much applicable to that at least basic standards on auditing ensure that you are reading that i will give another example all of us are signing audit report at branches how many of us correlate that with sa 700 format line by line we don't do that we presume that central auditor has already done that right because that is a prescribed format let someone in your office read that line by line it will add value to his knowledge which in turn will help you in some other audit because he is aware that line by line reading is mandatory sometimes you know there are errors like uh, i am not talking about bank branch audit because there this error doesn't happen but many times instead of profit losses are written losses profit is written qualified opinion only opinion we don't change that actually it depends upon what we are written in earlier year so don't let that happen uh, as far as these formats are concerned as far as standards on auditing are concerned they are there to be complied by you and as far as any remote possibility of disciplinary action is concerned if you are not complied with any standard on auditing then your case becomes weak if you don't follow any guidance note your case is on a weaker footing because then you have to prove that how you were correct so it's very difficult to prove that you know it, many times we are always on a Uh, you know, weaker ground whenever the disciplinary case starts because we don't have adequate documentation. So ensure that that is done. As far as bank audit guidance note is concerned, there are illustrative formats which are already available. Make use of that. Don't make use as copy paste. Adopt that. At times, wording might be we and you are a proprietor, so you are not supposed to use that. You need to say I. At least you know uh, make those changes. Wherever I slash we is written, it doesn't mean that both should be kept. One is supposed to be cancelled. So. we need to you know ensure that these basic precautions are taken by all of us so that yeah see as far as emphasis of matter para is concerned if you are not uh, i should say comfortable with a particular practice for example in case of gold loan uh, you are not able to point out any query uh, but you feel that uh, there has to be uh, you know valuation which should be carried out at the branch instead of taking that packet outside the branch something of that sort, that sort see these are the discrepancies wherein you don't want to qualify the report but you want to invite attention of the reader but If, uh, rather than emphasis of matter para typically disclaimer of opinion is common at branch audit like for example i will just take that gold loan case further suppose you are having say 1000 gold loans at a branch you cannot verify all 1000 loans so there is a systemic failure at the branch that every loan is renewed you know every year so you can maybe say check 20 25 loans you know that to at the maximum level you can give a disclaimer by saying that out of 1000 uh, portfolio 500 are renewed like that Out of that twenty, we have verified, and in all twenty accounts, we have found it out. But we are not able to quantify. So we suggest that uh, you know the adequate uh, uh, measures are taken. So that's a disclaimer. Emphasis of matter para, it's not that common. Because typically the banks will work in uh, uh, as per their uh, uh, you know internal guidelines. 
But why that para is given is suppose some auditor has something to write in that emphasis of matter para, the central auditor will not be otherwise aware about that. So that's why that that is always retained at the branch level. But that is not that common at branch. You can give nil. See if there is nothing which you want to add, no need to give that. Disclaimer also only in extreme case wherein you are of the opinion that bank as a whole there might be an issue or branch as a whole also there is an issue. You can always give it. There. If you are giving something in LFR which is having a ramification of audit report, it has to appear on both audit report also in LFR. In fact, just to put it in different way, if you are qualifying anything in LFR, uh, sorry, main audit report, or writing an emphasis of matter para in LFR uh, in audit report, there has to be elaborate uh, commentaries there in LFR. But in LFR, if you write something which is more of observatory or suggestive in nature, that may not appear in audit. But LFR is not replacement to audit report. LFR is not replacement to MOC. And uh, I didn't want it to say, but I will, uh, you know, since you have taken out that topic, I will say, at times, you know, auditors have a tendency to write in LFR, they write entire para, you know, multiple paras and say that central auditor should take a suitable decision. You are the auditor of that branch. So central auditor is not going to take any decision. No, you need so to say that whether it is PA or NPA. You cannot say that this is the circumstances. Now, uh, we want to bring this to the attention of central auditor to decide that whether it is PA or NPA. Don't let that happen. It becomes a laughable stop. And unfortunately, all central auditors have few cases wherein such comments are mentioned. So after reading LFR, you know, you suddenly realize that there was something wrong at the branch, but by the time audit report is signed, because the problem is LFR consultation is by June end. So LFR, typically central auditors habitually read that for the same purpose that no query should be missed out. But that is not the real intention actually. Everything should appear in audit report to the extent it is going to affect your financials or your opinion on financials to be specific. It should be concurrency with the MOC Yeah, of course. In fact, MOC also, when you're giving MOC, better to give elaborative details of that in LFR as a kind of support. So. Uh, your reason of giving that MOC is uh, you know, well explained in LFR because that is the only document where you can write pages or write in elaborative form. In MOC, typically the remark column might be restricted to a few uh, number of pages, a uh, few number of uh, characters. Uh, let me just touch upon the last point which I want to make. See, wherever you are concluding the audit, I just wanted to suggest you one more thing to do. Based on your experience of current year's audit, just jot down the points which according to you have gone wrong, right from audit planning stage. You always realize at the end of the audit that we should have conducted audit in a little different form or in a, li a little different way. You might have come across certain experiences, which if they are known to you prior to commencement of audit, you might have taken a different stand or a different uh, process. So make it a habit to kind of a, write down a closing summary, I should say, of what went wrong or what was the correct practice which you followed. Because what happens is, in the next year, you start that audit after a gap of one year. So all those loose ends which you have left out in the earlier year, you can use it for the next year audit. So make it a habit that you have this kind of a practice which is set up. Be vocal about that. That is not part of your audit working paper file per se, because it's for your own consumption. Even if mistakes are there, you can write down that these were the mistakes which occurred. Like for example, if you feel that you spent too much time in going into maybe certification part, which was not really warranted, the systems were robust. Note that observation so that next year there might be a uh, you know particular area wherein you wanted to devote more time. So note it down. So next year you can rectify uh, your procedures. Once you do that, actually, you will become kind of a habitual for every audit. Why only for bank audit? Even when we are closing tax audits, we are fully aware about what we did and what we were supposed to do. If you are true to yourself, you can easily list down all those details for every client. Somehow we try to manage that at the fag end. Then we always say that we should warn our client that if it is not received at so and so date, I am not going to file that audit report or I'm not going to do tax audit. We never do that in practice. We never send any letter to our client notes. So I adopt this practice to list down that where things have gone wrong and what should have been the best practice and try to adopt that as much as possible. Gradually in years to come, you will reach to that stage where your practice gets improvised. So that was all on an overall basis, uh, which I thought that I would just share with you. I drifted away from the topic in between, but it was just to more give you a kind of a, uh, insight about uh, where you should not restrict yourself only to the bank audit. 
and don't feel uh, uh, you know get into a negative mode that it is 70% 50% as i said that whatsapp, whatsapp university is uh, open university so don't uh, get into that one more thing again as a suggestion see many a times there are reports related to institute or related to rbi guidelines which get floated don't immediately believe in that that's why i said that ask the person who has posted it that what is the source of that things get simpler many a times you know it's like uh, grape wine actually or uh, chinese whisper i should say it changes the form and many times that is not the reality so it's better to uh, you know stop that at a particular point uh, just two things uh, which i will just uh, like to add which was suggested one was about embezzlement in uh, uh, other banks or private sector banks uh, nowadays actually most of the banks including private sector banks have a process of tendering tendering in the sense embezzlement to be very specific so there are various kinds of assignments which are available for bank right from concurrent stock audit till uh, diligence audit uh, is also there diligence audit is a form wherein if the multiple financing is there and the exposure is more than 5 crores diligence reporting is mandatory diligence it is not due diligence it is diligence reporting only now all these uh, you know impanelments are available throughout the year so even if you missed out in a particular year again that opportunity opens up so keep your uh, uh, you can say eyes and ears open whenever the impanelment happens uh, have your form impaneled over there later on you can make a choice whether to accept that assignment or not the reason being unless and until it is not remunerative for you ensure that you are saying no to that assignment and have some time for yourself in the sense to find out other work i'm not saying that you should sit idle and enjoy the life i'm not even saying that because for practicing ca i really doubt whether that is really becoming possible to work five days a week and other thing five days a week can come for everyone but we will be always there on 6 and 7 day under the pretext that uh, those are the days when we can work that's what really happens section here 365 days 24 yeah so what what i mean to say is that have some space created to accept new work which we are lacking that's why initially only i said that how many of us are sitting idle none of us right now also when you are attending this back of your mind you are listing down n number of uh, pending work which you need to compl- complete before today or before end of the year n number of things are there don't let that happen create some space to accept new assignments then only your practice can get into a different dimension actually otherwise you will confine to existing uh, you know clientele with whom you are not satisfied and another thing is that it is little um, i should say uh, blunt to say if no client is leaving you for so many years it's a indication that you are uh, you know you are charging him much lesser fees as compared to the market <laughs> see otherwise at least one client should leave us how many of you have you know are having clients who are leaving you because you are raising the fee i really doubt actually no one leaves actually how many clients have left because of uh, increase in fees many clients leave then they leave so it never going to happen so it is a simple thing we are here almost say 50 persons suppose your 20 percent client will go up they will go to some other uh, see he doesn't have that time also yeah it's See, practically, actually, uh, so many clients will never leave. How twenty percent and twenty five percent clients are going to leave us? It, it never happens. See, that's why I'm asking you that for last ten years, just introspect. How many clients left us because we increased the fee? None. I will give you one more, uh, you know, uh, uh, example. Again, a little, uh, uh, you can say, uh, difficult to hear. How many of us have been able to recover MSME interest? All of us are registered under MSME. i'm sure that all of you are uh, no if not then register yourself you have right to recover interest if you are paid after 45 days but again i'm saying it is right to recover nothing beyond that on one side we report msme outstanding in roc returns every year we do that in most of the cases our own fees are appearing over there now income tax has come out with uh, you know disallowances wherever the uh, fee, uh, wherever the amounts are outstanding related to msme beyond 45 days don't let ourselves be part of that so somewhere down the line we need to discipline that somewhere the down the line we should stop giving credit we are not banks we can't lend credit to others and i will just give a simple example why i am insisting on that since certain investigation cases uh, the forensic auditors or the government regulatory uh, investigating agencies they concluded 
that if the auditor was not paid for two years, years, which is a common scenario, I'm sure that every one of us has one or two clients like that. They went to such an extent, they said that why the auditor was continuing as, you know, as an auditor when he was not paid for two to three years. What was the reason? So it means that he was being paid some kickbacks, you know, which are not appearing uh, on the record. That's the conclusion which regulatory agencies are making. Be aware about that. You never know that when things will go wrong. And it's better to stop at a particular point than to repeat later. Don't uh, start extending your credit period beyond the point. Or factor in that by telling the client that if you are going to pay at so and so date, this is my fee. Ultimately, you are also running a business. You are, you are also there. You need to also pay salaries to your uh, people. Like just to give an example, every year if your staff is expecting 10% rise, but you don't rise your fees by 10%, it's a charitable business which you are doing, which we need to uh, introspect at some point of time. I'm not saying that it will be across all the intersection of our client. At least to the major section of client, you need to introspect on that. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Now, so as far as employment is concerned, there are many employment processes which are available in private sector also and in public sector also. Uh, banks don't have sufficient manpower and they like CH services because we are the cheapest labor which is available. See, if at 15,000 rupees, if someone is doing a concurrent audit, it means that one man is available for disposal of the bank and who is paid below minimum wages actually. So some banks are having 10,000 also and auditors are accepting that. So just think twice before you accept that, whether it is outflow or whether it is inflow, ultimately it, it needs to amount at least one rupee inflow. And you need to factor your own time cost also. Don't factor just salary cost of your staff. You also have your... Uh, uh, you know, own requirements. Okay, then uh, a little bit about uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Again, uh, it's a personal view. And uh, frankly speaking, there are too many news articles which are coming up. So we don't know where this is uh, going to end up. Uh, the initial uh, news article, what it is suggesting is, just to put it in simple terms, in banking sector and in all corporate sector, whenever you are investing in long-term investments, the long-term investments, unless there is a permanent diminishing in value, they are never marked to market. So suppose I'm having a long-term investment, which is made in say government securities, which is a safe security. Today's rate of interest is say 5%. I make an investment with a yield of 5%. Tomorrow, suppose the interest rates are rising. Suppose the rates are at 7% now, naturally the security price will decline. So uh, pure, uh, you know, mathematical, it might be say 94, 95, somewhere around that range because of, uh, rate increase. Now what happens is, as far as the current portfolio of any entity is concerned, that is always mark to market because it is a trading portfolio. So when you are talking about from banking side, uh, AFS, HFT and HTM, there are the three categories that is available for sale, uh, held to maturity is HTM and held for trading is again current portfolio. So AFS and HFT, they are always mark to market. So wherever the price fluctuation happens, those are captured. And by Indian context, we don't capture appreciation. Appreciation is ignored. Only depreciation, if it is there, it is made as a floating provision. So there is a hit on PNL account. As far as HTM portfolio is concerned, there is never a hit on PNL account. So if I have a health to maturity portfolio, subject to again compliance with RBI norms, because there are norms which don't allow a bank to go beyond a point. So there is a restriction. I cannot have all my portfolio under HTM category. That is not permitted in Indian context. But in HTM portfolio, there might be mark to market losses or mark to market depreciation to be very specific, which might be occurring over there. Now, as the news article suggests, what might have happened is, suppose there is a liquidity crunch for any bank for whatever reasons, let's not get into that reasons. So naturally there will be a pressure to create liquidity. Like suppose customers start withdrawing the amount. So ultimately liquidity has to be created. So initially maybe AFS HFT portfolio might be sold off, but ultimately you might have to take you know that HTM portfolio and sell it off. The moment you sell off HTM portfolio, the losses will get booked. That's what exactly uh, is appearing in news article as of now. What is appearing over and above that is, then the bank tried to recoup those losses by way of raising capital so that the net worth is intact. And then the rumor will start it off. That's what is appearing till date. Again and again, why I'm saying that is, this is what is the reality uh, in media. And articles are written by persons who are not related to treasury. So there are innovative ideas which get floated out. 
there are there are articles which are correlating this with indian banking system also but there is a basic difference in indian banking system and uh, system in abroad we are having robust system wherein regulators are having multiple ways to create liquidity like to just to give an example 18% aclr is mandatory and crr is 4% 5% whatever is defined it means that to that extent every bank will have kind of a secured portfolio so to that extent everyone can absorb the hits of liquidity crunch now whenever the slr security if it is uh, you know if it is given as a security for availing any loan as, as suppose it is encumbered security to that extent slr coverage ratio gets reduced so the bank has to be always above that 18% at any given point of time so suppose you have a 23% slr so 5% you can uh, you know give it as a uh, encumbrance for any other loan to be raised but your 18% remains unencumbered so that is the first thing second thing is that uh, banks are given liquidity facility support from the rbi side also so there are ways and means of that so one is repo reverse repo where it securities can be kept as a as a security and amount can be borrowed against that but that is not counted for slr purpose but there is a window which is permanently open for short term liquidity so for the marginal finance facilities rbi has is having a separate window wherein securities will be encumbered with rbi liquidity will be created but still it can be counted for slr purpose only thing is that the rate of interest are on a higher side because you get this facility so there is a cushioning which is created you know in indian banking system so no need to sell the securities permit no need to sell you can keep it with rbi and borrow against that but there is a hitch in that for any borrowing the borrowing will be always based on market value not on the face value basis so that's a remote value yeah so that's where a uh, tickly situation is but that's how accounting is uh, happening you cannot have hkm securities which are marked to market because it will then entirely change the structure of banking entirely change the structure of corporates also because in corporates also wherever you are having long term investments unless and until there is a permanent diminishing in value you uh, there is a impairment of any investment you cannot do mark to market exercise because then everything will become become mark to market so that's not the context actually but so far that's what has been surfacing we don't know you know how it is going to end even though the government has extended the support and other things there might be some other different undercurrents which gradually will come up uh, frankly speaking uh, as far as indian uh, banking scenario is concerned uh, applying that to indian banking system is a far fetch exercise we don't have that kind of a, a scenario we have other problems some 10000 or 20000 crore some kind of entity no i agree so that is not the reality actually i will tell you the reality about that uh, it's very easy to say that someone will run away with the money uh, it's question of bad monitoring that's happening so if i agree to a yes you need to see also how the recovery is made uh with this insolvency uh, you know act which is coming into play the time gap it is gradually getting reduced second thing is that earlier there were very much there were large leverages which were given by rbi also like you know to do restructuring there were different schemes which were launched so that you can retain the class of asset now if you look at the resolution plan first thing is that you have to downgrade the asset so there is no uh, you can say white wash which uh, anyone can do and rbi uh, apparently is very stubborn about that they have no more extending any concessions as far as npa marking is concerned barring that covid 19 period that six months moratorium which was given but apart from that since last couple of years or multiple years actually uh, that those concessions are not there now the best part about resolution plan is that the action has to immediately commence there is a very short period which is given so when the account is under stress the action is already starting off as compared to earlier uh, you know instances where in account used to be carried out uh, in the balance sheet as a standard loan which is not really happening there is no concessional treatment now that forex scheme joint lender forum all these schemes have been scrapped actually long back almost i think more than 5 years now so compared to earlier days now whatever is there that is happening in black and white which is a good thing to have it's better to face in phase rather than to postpone that but at the same time uh, there are times when for uh, surviving a particular economy all the regulators across the globe are giving some incentives there are differential accounting practices which the regulators are suggesting even though they may or may not really gel with accounting uh, principles or accounting standards so it's a kind of a balancing act what we need to do as auditor is that 
we shouldn't be shying away from reporting which is uh, you know which is which is a kind of a wrong happening at any branch or at a corporate level that's our job actually once we do that actually things are simpler just to give an example earlier most of the bankers used to argue with the auditors that par if the partial recoveries are made in an account like say in case of term loan account if six installments are overdue but by year end if i bring it down to two the account should be uh, categorized as standard auditors were you know literally fighting about you know or arguing about this case rbi itself made it clear that they were expecting that entire recovery should be made this is a classic case of that second example is that subsequent recoveries you know like recoveries made after 31st march rbi is very much categorically clear that at the end of the day every account should be tested whether it is pa or np it should be automated so if account is np on 31st march it is np on 31st march even if it is closed on 4th april on 4th april there will be a recovery of np it can be backdated what kind of backdate is possible is that suppose something is parked in interbranch account and there is a entry which is missed out that is fine it's a rectification it's not something which has happened subsequently and you are giving a backdated event that will never happen so our job is to stick to our principles we need to be very firm on accounting principles don't lose sight on your accounting side that's what we are having you know as expertise we are chartered accountants we are not management consultants so accountancy is the core area which we are having don't lose that uh, sight on that i will just add one last point about talking about accounting part i'm sure that the next uh, speaker will definitely cover that so as far as iri comes are concerned iri automation is mandated so wherever you see that sufficient master data is not captured by the system it means that automation will never work for example in agriculture loan if you don't capture the data of crop season your automation will always fail because the basic data itself is not there so always keep your eyes open about flaws in the system because of which automation is not possible start reporting that because all banks are saying that everything is automated and all of us know actually where the flaws are make use of that and secondly as far as accounting of interest is concerned concept of realization of interest is concerned it is accounting concept it's not regulatory concept apply your normal yardstick of accounting entries there is nothing beyond accounting what we are certifying is compilation of different accounting entries that's what uh, you know ultimately uh, happens to be a gla so don't shy away from uh, raising any query to accounting there are wrong banking practices also which might happen i'm not saying that everything is wrong but banking practice cannot override accounting principle accounting principle always remain as it is so with this i will just conclude my session thank you very much for patiently hearing me if any queries are there uh, i will share my contact number with the branch and uh, uh, at any point of time uh, all of you are welcome to uh, communicate thank you very much thank you thank you very much sir for your detailed discussion on the planning of bank audit friends uh, uh, we had a very excellent session uh, particularly for young members uh, i was also a young member at some point of time so at that time no also thank you <laughs> at that time where expert speakers have come i used to of course today i might have asked the four or five queries which i got it a clarified final points some of them for me of course it may not be final points for all of you so at that point of time what i i, I used to fear uh, to ask or pose any question so but to my dear young friends at least we will take some so with your permission two or three minutes any of the young member who want to ask a query don't keep it in yourself at least one or two uh, two young members if you can uh, pose your query to the speaker uh, i think it will be because uh, such as a speaker of such a stature uh, we uh, kindly accepted uh, to come to vijayawada and address us at least one or two of you if you are keeping any query to yourself i may request you to please pose the query so that uh, as a management will be more than happy that uh, we have done something to the fraternity anything any any, any doubt don't think that uh, 
uh, it may it might be a silly doubt. It, it, it can't be like that. Anyone, anyone. So you can issue you can issue a covering report for that. Separately. Yeah, yeah, of course. We do that. Because we don't we don't give only yes and no. Yeah, everything cannot be yes, everything cannot be no. That is true. You have to issue a covering report. Separately. Separately. Manual. See, no one can stop you from issuing manual reports. No one can stop you from issuing any report for that matter. But no one told me till now, sir. Just everyone saying yes or no. Yes. Not yet, yet. You look at the right answer. Yes. The 30 years in fact, uh, I appreciate that, but at the same time, uh, guidance note was issued in 2016. So, already, uh, yes, we are signing last day, sir. Last day, last minute. So, that's why I said that you know, ask for those certificates uh, at the start of the audit itself. Don't wait for it. The moment you are waiting, if you are not asking the branch, they will take to keep everything ready, but they will give you only at the end of the, of the last day. But is there any weightage for those? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, no. yeah. Uh, I will tell you. I will tell you, sir. I will. Uh, I will just tell you a sort of on the record. Of, you know, on the record is not uh, an issue. Uh, two three years back, uh, I think in 2018, 19, uh, every question is that. It's very difficult to remove any question.